Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are no longer on recess. We're calling the meeting back to order. We have several public hearings. And the first public hearing that we have is agenda item number seven, which is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget for the Department of Environmental Protection in the amount of $372,079 for Naval Support Activity Bethesda Military Installation Resiliency, Resiliency Review Grant. Uh, action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. Each individual will have two minutes to speak. Individuals will be alerted as they approach their two minutes and may be disconnected. Uh, also, there may be technical glitches during the public hearing that may need to be addressed by our staff. So thanks in advance for your patience. Um, there are, it's my understanding there are no speakers for this public hearing, and I guess I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. We're now going to close this public hearing, and is there a motion? I move. It's been moved by Councilmember Navarro, seconded by Second. Councilmember Reamer. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is, or do we have... Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. The next item that we have is agenda item number eight. This is a public hearing on the planning board draft amendment for the Misrobian House amendment to the ma a master plan for historic preservation. Um, um, action is tentatively uh, for uh, today. Uh, no, no. Uh, action is tentatively scheduled for November 10, 2020. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business day, October 23rd. And it's my understanding we do have speakers for this public hearing. Yes, Mr. President, we do. Our first speaker is Howard Burkhoff. Mr. Burkhoff, you may unmute and begin your testimony. You will have two minutes. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Excellent. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Burkhoff, and my wife Lauren and I are thrilled to be the new owners of the Misrobian House. We were drawn to the art modern style, the well-planned layout, and the many original details in the house. The architecture of the house really speaks to us, especially during these unprecedented times. The style of art modern is a subdued response to the overly ornate Art Deco period. The focus is on function with a sophisticated yet plain approach to style defined by smooth curves and whitewashed brick. I often think of the similarities between the times we are living in and the period in which this home was built. The house was born in a time when the country faced great challenges as it does today. I'm comforted knowing the house was built against the odds, withstood difficult times, and will remain strong well beyond this time. We are honored to be the custodians of such a fine property and support the historical designation of the Misrobian House. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Caroline Hickman. Ms. Hickman, you may unmute and begin your testimony. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, hearing me. Uh, thanks to the council. And I want to speak uh, just for a moment or two about um, my, uh, I've started the video, here I am, thank you. Um, I am an architectural historian. I teach architectural history at the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And I am also a granddaughter of the architect of the Mesrobian House, Maron Mesrobian, and I prepared the uh, landmark nomination for the house. And I just want to um, um, bring up a few points. Uh, if you've read the, uh, had a chance to read the nomination, Maron Mesrobian uh, is a master, considered a master architect in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, he was uh, an um, architect in Ottoman Turkey, received his uh, training there, and then immigrated to the United States in 1921 
quickly began working for Harry Wardman, the largest real estate developer uh, here in the area, and was with him until his death, of uh, Wardman's death in 30, 1938. And they built uh, seminal hotels, apartment houses, uh, houses uh, through the area. Um, by the time of 1941, when the Mesrobian house was constructed, um, Mesrobian had worked uh, in Art Deco style, some of his um, well-known buildings uh, in the city. And then, but for his residence, for him and his family, he chose the uh, a modernist style. And uh, this art modern um, was, uh, you know, of great importance to him. We see him using the style in the um, uh, garden complex apartments in Northern Virginia. Um, and um, as far as the style of the house is concerned, when you think about where it's located on the major artery of Connecticut Avenue, um, it stands out among the traditional revivalist style houses. So it's an important example of the art modern style. Ms. Hickman, it, Ms. Hickman yes. sorry, your time is up. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that concludes our speakers, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and might I add to Ms. Hickman, we will read the rest of your, of your testimony. Uh, action, this public hearing is now closed and action is tentatively scheduled for November 10th, 2020. The next item on our agenda is agenda item number nine. And this is a public hearing on Bill 4220, Ethics, Public Accountability and Transparency Amendments. This bill would require the executive to disclose employment contracts with non-merit appointees and non-merit employees to the council include the sale of promotion of certain intellectual property by a public employee as other employment and regulate the participation of a public employee who has received compensation from an individual or organization in a procurement that, with that individual or organization. It will also require a public employee to disclose certain sources of earned income in a financial disclosure statement, prohibit the chief administrative officer from engaging in other employment and generally amend the laws governing public accountability and trust. A government operations committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 23rd. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business day, October 26th. If you, would if you would like to follow the progress of a council bill, the council website has a subscribe function. Go to the council website and use the view council records and legislative updates link to learn how. Well, it's my understanding, Ms. Kennedy, we actually have two speakers, if that's correct. I believe I have one. One, I have, you have yes. only one, have yes, one you, are, you are correct. Yes, yeah. yeah. and, and that is Mr. Dale Tibbetts. Mr. Tibbetts, you may begin your testimony. Um, hello, Gar. Good afternoon, uh, Council President Katz, Vice President Hucker, and Council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Dale Tibbetts, Special Assistant to County Executive Mark Elridge. It is my pleasure to appear before the Council on behalf of the County Executive to provide a brief testimony on Bill 4220 the county executive fully supports this bill. The county executive is firmly committed to ensuring transparency in our government. This includes holding all non-merit employees to a high standard of ethical conduct. The county executive believes this bill takes appropriate measures to ensure that our highest level employees avoid conflicts of interest and are fully committed to serving our community. Uh, we look forward to working with the council on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you. We are closing the public hearing. It is now closed. And again, the uh, Go Committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 23rd. The next item that we have, item number 10, is a public hearing on Bill 4320, non-merit employees, merit system employees severance pay limited, this bill would prohibit severance pay for a county employee unless authorized by law, prohibit severance pay for certain employees who violate the ethics law, provide for certain exceptions, and generally amend the law 
governing severance pay for county employees. A government operations committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 23rd. Persons wishing to submit additional material to the, for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business day, October 26th. Ms. Kennedy, is my understanding we do have a speaker. We do. Uh, Berkey Attila, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Berkey Attila, director of the Office of Human Resources. It's a pleasure for me to appear before the council on behalf of the county executive to provide the testimony on Bill 43-20. The county executive fully supports the intent of this bill, but would like to suggest a few amendments. In responding to the provisions and intent of the bill, I would note that this county must continue to be able to attract and retain superior talent. How we attract and retain talent is very much based on a set of policy choices and the economic conditions under which these choices are may can vary somewhat over time. Therefore, the county executive would support a provision that allows severance pay under conditions where they are authorized by law and under conditions where discretionary severance pay for non-merit employees is based on a schedule that has been affirmatively approved by the council. We believe that there are cases where the council would agree that it makes sense to provide discretionary severance pay to non-merit employees. We look forward to working with the council on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our speakers for this hearing. Thank you. The public hearing is now closed. And there again, a work session is tentatively scheduled for the, uh, with the Government Operations Committee on November 23rd. The next item, item number 11, is a public hearing on Bill 4420, Racial Equity and Social Justice Impact Statements, Advisory Committee Amendments. This would require a racial equity and social justice impact statement for each zoning text amendment, add two public members to the racial equity and social justice advisory committee, authorize the executive to establish one or more task forces to study and make recommendations on a specific issue and generally amend the law governing racial equity and social justice. A government operations committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 23rd, persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so by the end of business day, October 26th. Ms. Kennedy, it is my understanding we do have speakers. Yes, that is correct. The first speaker for this public hearing is Tiffany Ward. Ms. Ward, you may unmute and begin your testimony. Good afternoon, council members. I am Tiffany Ward. I'm the director of the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, and I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of County Executive Mark Elridge today. The County Executive supports this bill. He also supports the recommended amendment submitted by the Office of the County Attorney. We look forward to continuing to work with the County Council on this shared initiative and putting more voices and con that contribute to the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice and our Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jane Lyons. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, good afternoon, President Katz and council members. My name is Jane Lyons and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Bill 4420. Bill 4420 would require the Office of Legislative Oversight, among other things, to submit a racial, racial equity and social justice impact statement for zoning text amendments. We are excited to see the inclusion of these impact statements on ZTAs, given the explicit, explicit racial and exclusionary history of zoning in Montgomery County. Over the summer, as some of you know, CSG partnered with the group Challenging Racism to host a series of courageous conversations about housing, land use, and racism. We discussed the history of federal redlining policies impact on Montgomery, but also learned about how many of the county's early developers were ardent segregationists who used every tool at their disposal, including the creation of single family zoning to build neighborhoods that were not welcome to people who were not white. The county is still working today to reverse the legacy of those decisions and other land use and planning decisions that contributed to upholding the East-West racial and socioeconomic divide. As the county is now working to create more welcoming and inclusive communities, we believe that racial equity and social justice impact statements for ZTAs will be a useful tool. 
Given the complexity of race planning and zoning issues, we do recommend creating an official role for the planning department and their professional expertise in the creation of impact statements for ZTAs. Discerning the equity impacts um, on anything is not an exact science and leaves room for nuance, which is where we believe the knowledge of the planning staff will be extremely useful. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bruce Turnbull. Mr. Turnbull, you may begin. Thank you. Sorry, too many buttons to push. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Bruce Turnbull, and this testimony is presented on behalf of myself and Jews United for Justice. Based on our Jewish values, JUFJ was an early and strong supporter of the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. We support the changes proposed in Bill 44-20, but want to raise an additional issue for a possible amendment to the law. The first RESJ impact statement that the OLO prepared pointed out a potentially significant gap in the act. The fact that expedited legislation is exempt from the act's RESJ impact statement requirement. Although impact statements are provided for fiscal and economic impacts of ex expedited legislation. The council considered and passed um, Bill 40-20E on September 29 without, without an RESJ impact statement. OLO issued an RESJ impact statement on that bill on September 30, finding that the bill would, quote, slightly widen racial and social disparities among business owners and among residents, unquote, and that there are modifications that would minimize or eliminate these negative impacts, but noting that the purpose of the legislation was not to address such impacts. We see two problems here. First, the council should have waited in order to consider the RESJ impact statement, even for the expedited legislation. Second, the RESJ impact statement itself should have contained suggested amendments to mitigate adverse effects, even though the bill itself was not intending to address such effects. RESJ impact statements may have their most important effect if they point out unintended or unexpected consequences of legislation that is ostensibly directed at issues other than racial equity and social justice. JOFJ encourages the council to amend the act to provide for RESJ impact statements for expedited legislation and to work with the OLO to include proposed amendments in RESJ impact statements for all legislation. JOFJ thanks the council for this opportunity to provide our views on this important legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Kolar. Ms. Kolar, you may begin. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Kohler and I'm testifying on behalf of Montgomery Housing Alliance. MHA strongly supports Bill 4420, especially the proposed requirement for racial equity and social justice impact statements for each new zoning text amendment. We commend Council Member Navarro for introducing this important legislation and the full council for unanimously sponsoring the bill. As affordable housing providers and advocates, MHA members recognize the way zoning decisions crucially impact low-income residents and communities of color. Throughout the country, zoning and land use policies often have, whether intentionally or unintentionally, been used to advantage certain populations while disadvantaging, disadvantaging others. Montgomery County is no exception. In particular, zoning decisions have historically impacted housing outcomes and contributed to segregated neighborhoods. Residential segregation results in inequitable access to important aspects of residential life, including health care, transportation, schools, healthy food options, and parks and recreation facilities. Housing discrimination and segregation lead to deeply negative outcomes for low-income households and households of color, especially African-American households. There persists a dramatic gap between homeownership rates for African-American families and white families. In fact, the African-American homeownership rate is as low as it was 50 years ago. This impacts families' ability to benefit from home equity and has generational impact. Children of homeowners experience better health, education, and earnings outcomes. As the county strives to deliberately address institutional inequities, issues of housing must be at the forefront. Zoning policies are a critical factor in furthering housing justice. Instituting inclusive policies that foster development of high quality affordable units across the entire continuum of housing in all communities is an effective way to address racial and economic inequities that persist in the county. Again, we applaud the council's efforts to build a more inclusive and equitable Montgomery County. Bill 4420 is an important step towards the goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Mr. President, that concludes the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you. Um, this public hearing is now closed. And there again, a uh, Government Operations Committee work session is tentatively scheduled for November 23rd. The next item, item number 12, is a public hearing on expedited bill 1619, Special Capital Improvements Project, Goody Landfill Remediation. This bill would authorize the planning, design, and construction of the Goody Landfill Remediation P801801 project in the Rockville area. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. It is my understanding, Ms. Kennedy, there are no speakers. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So we will close this public hearing. This is an action item. Is there a motion? Let's move the appropriation. Councilmember Raymer. And it's seconded by Councilmember Navarro. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And I believe I'm counting nine. Yes, it carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And Ms. Kennedy, I believe that is all of the public hearings. Is that correct? Yes, that concludes our public hearings for today. Thank you very much. Next is Legislative Day 30, which is the call of bills for final reading. The first one is expedited bill. 1619 Special Capital Improvements Project, Cooty Landfill and Remediation. And I I guess that would have to be a um, roll call. Is that is that correct? Is that why it's on twice? Yes, Mr. President, that's correct. Okay, so Madam, I have a feeling I know how this is going to turn out, but Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Tawando. Yes. Mr. Tawanda votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Hucker? He's saying, yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> Mr. Katz? Yes. So that does carry unanimously nine to zero. Um, the next bill is Bill 3220, Solid Waste Trash, Waste Reduction Slash, Source Reduction, and Single-Use Straws Requirements. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. That Perry. was the one that was withdrawn. That's deferred. Deferred, okay. That was deferred. We have a few late-breaking amendments. We'll reconsider it in committee. Very good. Thank you. But now for the 33, 3320, that remains... It does, on polystyrene, yes. Okay. So the next bill is Bill 3320, uh, Solid Waste Trash Food Service Products Packaging Materials Requirements. And there's a uh, t and &E recommended enactment with uh, amendments. Council Vice President Hucker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Um, bill 3320 was introduced way back in July at the request of the county executive and sponsored by the council president. Um, it was in the considered by the T and E committee October 12th. Um, as noted by Ms. Myhill's terrific packet, this would require the county exec to. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. I'm on the. I got to scan ahead here. Sorry. Two talking points, one memo. Um, you'd be forgiven if you believe polystyrene food products were already banned in Montgomery County. Um, in fact, our own council member Reamer. Uh, sponsored uh, legislation, Bill, Bill 4114, back in 2014, which banned the use of polystyrene for six years now. There are changes in the, um, there are difficulties in enforcement, and there's changes in the industry that require this bill to sort of clean clean up our current law and uh, improve our enforcement. Um, so this bill simply uh, expands the prohibition to include all food service products made from polystyrene, um, and also include and expands the definition to include polystyrene number six, which you all know as uh, most commonly as red solo cups because they simply can't be recycled uh, in Montgomery County. Um, the committee, you, um, this obviously um, um, fits with our climate goals, with our uh, use reduction goals, um, and helps us meet our recycling targets. The committee unanimously recommended enactment of this bill with just a few technical amendments um, to not delay enactment 
and also one that was proposed to not delay egg, uh, exempt egg cartons because they were intended to be banned by the 2014 legislation. A number of uh, jurisdictions have adopted bans on expanded polystyrene um, um, uh, and, and, and similar uh, polystyrene, disposable polystyrene products. Um, the committee was enthusiastic about passing this. I did, Mr. President, receive a late-breaking technical amendment to change section 4853 to remove the word sealed and replace it by the word packaged because not all packaged food products imported into the county are sealed um, and that amendment is supported by the department so um, i'd move that amendment okay. is there a second to the amendment councilmember reamer may is the person that has seconded that amendment was there anything else council Vice President, I think we have to vote on the amendment and then the amended bill. I appreciate that. Sorry, but there was nothing else. Um, Council Member Friedson, did you want to speak to the amendment? No, that's okay. I'll speak to the bill. I appreciate the, the amendment. Okay. So we have a. Let me see if anybody wants to speak to the Council Member Reamer. You want to speak to the amendment, right? No, thanks. Just the bill. Just the bill. Nobody wants to speak to the amendment. Okay. Um, so we have, and I, it has been moved by Council Member Vice President Hawker, seconded by Council Member Reamer for the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously. Okay. And thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, so I'm eager to move the, um, the. Well, you don't need to. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's 30. It was a committee recommendation. Leader. Council, thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. I appreciate the work that was done in a committee. Appreciate uh, Mr. Ortiz and all of his work. And I share the interest and appreciate his leadership on trying to improve the efficiency and the business operation of the county's recycling program, which has work to do. And uh, we should be doing better, can be doing better. I believe we'll be doing better uh, a a after this. Uh, Bill, I am a little concerned and will uh, uh, note uh, that it's a really tough time for a lot of these businesses, particularly the ones that are, um, you, know, you know, that have these products. Some of these products are popular, unfortunately, although I wish that they weren't. I think there are comparable alternatives as uh, Mr. Ortiz has uh, shared uh, with me that work very similarly, have similar costs, um, you know, but for corner stores and uh, some of the smaller businesses uh, in the county, I think this transition is going to be uh, difficult. We need to do better than we have done uh, in doing outreach to these businesses, which uh, recent events have, have really shown. So I just really want to highlight that, that we need to uh, be doing everything that we can to help folks transition and understand this. I'm not convinced that most people are going to be aware that this change has happened. So I just want to make sure that particularly in all communities in the county and all businesses uh, that, that they're aware, I think the large chains will be able to adapt very quickly. I think the small local corner stores will not have uh, as much ease. And so I just hope that there is uh, some significant sensitivity and uh, empathy for the challenges that those businesses are facing. I trust that there will be. I just wanted to note it uh, at, uh, at at this hearing. And I just, um, you know, I'm also sensitive to the fact that uh, folks can still buy these products online and uh, unfortunately still will be buying these products uh, online. And so we need to be working and helping not just with outreach to businesses, but to consumers uh, to explain why these products are bad uh, and you know, why it's bad for the environment, but also puts our local businesses at a competitive uh, disadvantage as bricks and mortar businesses who are going to be doing the right thing by following and complying with these new uh, standards and these new laws, which will have a benefit, but uh, may be doing so uh, at a competitive disadvantage to uh, online sales, which are already challenging our local uh, retailers uh, as we speak. So I just wanted to raise those issues. And if you could just quickly respond to what the plan is for the outreach specifically and how this is going to be implemented and how we're going to make sure that both the business owners, uh, particularly the small business owners that have less access to uh, information like this and are busy keeping their businesses afloat and also consumers, how that is going to proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Friedson, and good afternoon to you, Mr. President, members of the committee. Um, great to see you all, and I appreciate the discussion in T&E. And, Mr. Friedson, I appreciate our conversation yesterday. 
Um, we've done numbers of campaigns just like this. Recently, we did the, the expanded polystyrene. So we're going to follow much of the same formula, which um, I think most, if not everybody, said uh, was very successful. And to this day, we don't receive complaints about the way that that was implemented. And uh, in general, we're going to um, engage our mail lists. We have um, uh, robust databases because of various environmental programs where we're going and working with businesses on a variety of issues. We have field staff that are always out in the field talking to business owners. And we're going to engage in a hierarchy system. We're going to go after sort of the big vendors first, um, the ones that have numerous locations uh, but are under um, regional management, the big, big box stores, and then over time, We'll be working with the small retailers. Um, as all of you know, DEP is a very friendly department um, where we're going to uh, take it easy on folks. We're going to engage them. We're going to educate first. But we're not going to be punitive. And our policy is always you know, we want people to get rid of their existing stock um, you know, as they look at, at alternatives. Also, we have partnered, and I've talked to some council members um, about this, and this idea came from some of you, is to work with this this is that are using more sustainable products and to enlist them as um, coaches and educators uh, for other businesses. So we'll be doing that. We also have an ongoing conversation, very positive relationship with um, all the chambers, the Montgomery Chamber, as well as the local ones. So we'll be working with them. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there, uh, Mr. President, but Mr. Friedson, I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions uh, about our, our engagement with, um, with the retailers, large and small. Sure, I'd love to follow up on that. I think it's absolutely essential to this effort and I'd be particularly interested in knowing the timing of implementation based on the outreach if we're starting at the big fish which I get because we get most bang for our you know outreach effort in terms of the waste stream and the efficiency of the recycling program that makes sense for your team uh, but I am a little concerned if we're going last to the folks who would have the greatest challenges to know and implement this that we not uh, you know, hold that against them in terms of the timing of the implementation as we uh, help them uh, transition. So hopefully that will be uh, included and in part of uh, this effort in thinking not just when the bill is passed and the timeline that the bill sets, but when the outreach is happening and the timeline of uh, the proactive outreach that you and your team are going to have to do to make sure that uh, everybody understands the law before they're being asked to follow it. Thank you. Understood. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Hucker, did you want to comment on Council I, Member Freak? I, I think I think it's all been said, but I I, um, I would just um, remind everybody that that I uh, I totally agree with everything Council Member Friedson said. I think um, um, compared to um, uh, in contrast with other legislation, this is really a cleanup bill that's uh, meant to improve the enforcement of, of our existing law. Um, I actually raised this, the need for a public education campaign by DEP in the committee, and they agreed to that. I happen to think they're about the our highest functioning department in terms of communicating with the public and with retailers about our changing pesticide laws and recycling laws, and they've committed to, to do the outreach. So I think we'll, we'll hold them to that. Um, and but I I think this body is very good at you know walking and chewing gum at the same time we can respond to the recession and uh, be sensitive to the needs of our small businesses and also to the challenges facing us environmentally at the same time. Thank you, Councilmember Reno. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the committee chair for uh, his work on the legislation and the department uh, for you know bringing up uh, bringing this update to us. As uh, the chair said, Montgomery County banned polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, uh, I think it was six years ago. Um, it's been quite some time, and it has been a success. You know, I think we're all familiar going to restaurants, uh, you know, having the uh, takeout food containers that are now recyclable or, or compostable, and they work. Uh, they work just fine. So um, you know, I think it has been a very good, good policy. It's nice to see the state following suit. Uh, as everyone knows, the state legislature enacted a ban that will apply outside of Montgomery County this year. Uh, and that is a welcome change. And as I, as I did at committee, I wanna salute the young activists uh, at the public schools in Tacoma Park who spurred the city council of Tacoma Park to pass a polystyrene ban, uh, which helped inspire uh, the legislation that I introduced many years ago. Um, this bill, I think, is really important because there is a lot of confusion now about what products are recyclable and what are not. And the many of them look identical to the untrained eye. Um, and a lot of companies are claiming things are recyclable, 
even though they're not recyclable in Montgomery County, and they really aren't recyclable in a cost-effective way. So we've got to sift through all that. And, you know, when it becomes too confusing, it, it really uh, it, it clouds the whole system. It makes people throw things away that might be recyclable, and it's just it's needless. So um, I've always viewed this as a litter reduction uh, program, and uh, I think, you know, here we're, we're ensuring that more of our waste goes into the appropriate streams where it can not not water streams, but waste streams where it can be recycled uh, appropriately and minimize what is actually going to the incinerator um, and, uh, and incinerate. So uh, thank you to everyone um, for uh, what I hope will be support for the legislation and uh, certainly concur about the comments about, you know, needing to educate our small businesses. These kinds of solutions, market does tend to respond to them well and hopefully uh, you know, so far, we I think we've seen affordable alternatives for products. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll look to that to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Thank you very much, Council President. And, um, I first want to say that I agree with um, everything that's been said to this point. Look, um, it is going to be incredibly important for, for us to make sure uh, that we communicate uh, with our community but it's very similar, I think, to what we did with our coal tar sealant ban. And DEP was very prepared and did a great job of having items listed on its website. So that's one of the things that I would encourage so that any person at any time can be referred to a list and understand those great products that are out there that are comparable in price because it's great to say it once, but it's another thing to have it always there so that if folks need it and need to have it accessible, they can have that. It's something that, you know, folks who are struggling and, um, not really sure, can always refer to. And so I just think that would be a great thing. And then I do agree with what uh, Council Vice President Hucker said. Um, you guys have done a great job when it comes to outreach. Um, the pesticides, I got a number of them and I talked about them, uh, the flyers in the mail. Um, so you guys were putting it out there and we know not everybody's going to respond and pay attention to that. I get it. Um, but you are dotting your I's and crossing your T's. And I think that that's what matters most. It will be something that will be a long slog. So I do agree with Council Member Freitz and it will be hard for some folks to adjust. Um, you know, they have vendors that they've worked with. And so making sure that those vendors are still the vendors that they can utilize, that they have relationships with to get these new kinds of products, all that kind of stuff, you know, because if you have to change payment systems, you know, something I'm sensitive to is uh, the husband of a business owner when it comes to where you order your stuff from. And you've already got all those things set up. If you've got to do it differently, it does require more time and cost more money. Um, so those are things just to keep in mind. But I think, again, if we do the right things, if we provide the support uh, for our businesses, that they will be able uh, to certainly adapt to this change. It's just one in which I do agree that we need to be sensitive and give them the amount of support that's necessary. But I think with the right steps, uh, we can make this a seamless transition. So uh, great job by everybody. Thank you. Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to all that worked on this issue. Um, so. Of course, we know that a very large proportion of our small businesses um, are um, immigrant owned. Not all of them are connected to Chamber or go online and things of that nature. I was just curious, Mr. Ortiz, um, what are some of the ways that you're going to specifically reach out to uh, folks in that community so that everybody is ready uh, once this becomes effective? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Navarro. Good to see you. Um, a few different strategies. Um, some of the tried and true will certainly have uh, materials that are available in different languages and uh, we have resources to be able to translate. So that's that's baseline. Um, we have worked with, we're no stranger to a lot of these restaurants. We work with them on educating and enforcement, um, even door to door. Um, in addition to the chambers getting into the neighborhoods, um, we're also um, trying to identify local validators, people who are involved in that community who um, may not be. So uh, Omar Lazo, who we both know, for example, uh, has agreed to help on this uh, and, and other issues in educating businesses as well. And then, of course, we're, we always take um, recommendations. Um, you know, I hate to say complaint driven because it sounds so negative. But if, but if people find that somebody's not compliant and, you know, we get that from uh, some of you, you know, we'll go in uh, with the uh, with the language appropriate materials and be culturally sensitive in that conversation and make that transition. Um, but that's what's on my mind. But Councilwoman, we're happy to work uh, with your office on any suggestions uh, that you have. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I bring this up because I think that we, we definitely should get into the practice of having a ready-made template, if you will. You know, we have business navigators, we have our regional services centers who have, are doing extraordinary work in the community. We have Daniel Parra, for example, at the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, whose job specifically is to work with these, you know, folks. Um, there are, I think, a lot of um, great ideas. The promoters that we're now we're using, the promotores for, you know, health uh, promoters, I think that we can also engage. And so I, I, I guess I really would want us to start working on some kind of a template um, that it's ready made, um, not to mention all the community organizations and nonprofits that we have funded uh, to do this kind of work. And that way, once every time we have a particular bill like this, um, you know, we can deploy that particular template in, instead of trying to figure out, you know, what might work. Um, so anyway, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because I, I think we're so lucky that we have a lot of assets in place, but not necessarily in a um, strategic way that we can deploy them accordingly. Um, so it's just, you know, some of those suggestions that I mentioned, I think would be really awesome um, to, to help in this particular way. Because inevitably, you know, it's hard. I mean, I think for especially the smaller, you know, whether they're restaurants, et cetera, corner stores, um, sometimes it's hard to keep up with a lot of the changes that are happening. But thank you so much. Really appreciate your work. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, so noted. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you, uh, Director Ortiz, for being here and, and for leading this effort. And my colleagues are absolutely correct that the success of this legislation really comes down to public education. And we need to educate the businesses about these regulatory changes. But the flip side is that we also need to educate our residents that there are a number of products that they think are recyclable, but they're not. And the simple fact is that when you add those items into our uh, trash collection, our recycling waste stream, um, as, as I understand it, it actually uh, creates greater inefficiencies, a.k.a. costs the county money when that's put into our, our system. And so, you know, the number six polystyrene plastic materials, um, as as Director Ortiz usually does on his roadshow with his plastic solo cups, I don't know if he has them handy. There you go. I love your roadshow. Um, you know, they're not recyclable. And uh, I've been guilty of thinking they were recyclable. Uh, and uh, it's only through conversations like this that we learn they're not. And, uh, you know, if we want to maintain a healthy planet, one for generations to come, we need, we need to uh, evolve with the materials uh, of our time. And so, um, so the public education all around, yes, small businesses and yes, residents as well. Uh, and I will be mindful uh, of what I put into my blue bin uh, and hopefully other residents will as well through the public education campaign that DEP will do um, in earnest regarding this legislation. So, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. I certainly associate myself with all of the comments of my colleagues, which are outstanding. I'll just add two. Um, we we do know that restaurants are feeling an incredible amount of pain right now. We know that many people have been let go. I was proud to stand with my colleagues in appropriating funds carved out specifically for a restaurant community, uh, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed that with another round of federal funding, the county will continue to be in a position to help support those businesses that have been so disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So the timing of this bill I'm sensitive to, um, but agree wholeheartedly that it's the right thing to do um, and does carry forward and extend uh, a tradition of policy that addresses climate ch challenges. Uh, and as we know, local jurisdictions are going to continue to have to step up because we're not seeing the leadership we did under previous administrations in the federal government. So um, I, I think this is a good bill. I appreciate the amendments. Um, thank you, Chairman Hucker, for 
shepherding this. I think that uh, the amendments make a lot of sense, um, and I very much associate myself with the comments of Councilmember Navarro in wanting to make sure that our office also helps in any way we can in outreach uh, to the various communities. Uh, the Latino Economic Development Corporation, I think, could be a great partner here along with a number of other uh, institutions out in the community. So thank you, Mr. President. I yield back to you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Ortiz. Uh, good to see you. Um, as I, I remain enthusiastic about this bill, I think it's, it, for all the reasons my colleagues stated, it's the right thing to do at the right time. Um, and, and hopefully, God willing, in 14 days, we'll have a more sensible uh, environmental policy on the national level coming through. But uh, to Councilmember Albanizer's point, we have to do our part no matter what uh, here. And, uh, you know, I, I think I wanted to pick up on two things, just to remind you. I know we talked about this uh, months ago, and it's been echoed, I think, here today about the critical need for ambassadors uh, that I know you started to grow out. But I want to I think we all could add to um, of folks of our favorite carryouts and uh, places that probably are using these and have no clue, but have some of the best food in the county. Uh, that we want to make sure that we identify a very diverse group of ambassadors uh, that can help get this out and be on the forefront of creating the videos and the social media and the campaign. Uh, and as I've mentioned to you, I have some a lot of suggestions, and I know all of us will. Uh, and, uh, Councilmember Friesen probably has the most because he eats out every night, so so he can he can give you a whole whole list. Um, but uh, I and I also want to lift up what Councilmember Glass said. I think one of the things that I didn't know until several years ago was that with these bottles, you know, I normally don't do that. You can't. You have to take the top off, right? Am I right on that? To recycle it. It depends on the bottle, which makes it even more confusing. See, there you go. Yeah, if it's a different color, yes. Um, and it usually says or indicates that it's the same type of plastic. But, uh, Councilman, you to the point, it's, it's a confusing system. It's not clear. Yeah, so the more we can do on a whole range of educational activities, to my colleague's point, we need to do so we can become, uh, you know, better ourselves. So really happy to support it and appreciate all the work you're doing at DP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other speakers. Uh, this was a committee recommendation, and it's a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass vote yes. Mr. Tawando? Yes. Mr. Tawando vote yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer vote yes. Mr. Varro? Yes. Mr. Varro vote yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos vote yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice vote yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Feets and vote chest, Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker vote chest, Mr. Katz? Yes. That carries unanimously nine to zero. Thank you very much. The next items that we're going to be working on are some work sessions. And the first one is the uh, 2020 to 2024 subdivision staging policy. Action is tentatively scheduled for November the 10th, 2020. Um, we're going to hear from Ms. Dunn and Dr. Orlin. But now, I don't know, uh, Councilmember Reamer, are you going to lead this off? Yes, please. Sorry, I'm trying to get my screen. No, you were supposed to be leading it off. Yeah, yes, go ahead. I, if only Zoom would allow me. There you go. Thank you. Well, um, the moment we've all been waiting for. This is a very significant policy that we're taking up. The packet, uh, I think, conveys that, um, you know, thoroughly. It's a it's a complex, deep policy with with many many decision points. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments, and then uh, if others wish to make comments, um, but then we'll turn it to council staff, uh, and under you, Mr. Council President, to kind of walk through. Uh, you know, the, the body's work. Um, but I wanted to just, uh, you know, uh, make a few observations that I think are consistent with the, the committee's recommendation. Um, this is a very big policy and, and what we've received from the planning board dem uh, represents a really dramatic and bold change from the status quo. And I wanna start by just thanking the planning board and the planning staff for their incredible work. Um, this is 
really a challenging area of great complexity. And I think they've done a terrific job giving us something that is responsive to what uh, many council members have been asking for, uh, which is to create a game-changing strategy for the county that can ensure we're meeting our infrastructure needs and at the same time uh, lift a cloud that has been hanging over this county for a really long time. Um, the facts are very clear. Our housing market is not producing enough new housing. Uh, historically, we produce well over 4,000 units of housing every year. That has slowed down dramatically uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and we've had years of 2,000 housing units. Uh, we are averaging under 3,000 housing units. And our concern about that housing shortage uh, certainly was a big part of our strong support for the regional housing goals that Councilmember Navarro uh, led our participation in through at COG. Um, and it has been animating our work in so many ways because I think many of us are hearing and, and we're, we're intuitively aware of the challenge that this county is presenting today to young families that want to get started or young workers that want to live here or seniors who want to downsize and remain in the community and the challenge of finding an affordable place to live as well as a high paying job. Uh, the two are very related. Uh, this policy that we're taking up and I think the recommendation that we've received goes right to the heart of something that is even bigger than housing. Uh, the housing shortage is making us a less prosperous community. I, I truly believe that. Um, our housing market's inability to produce regular additions to the supply of the housing uh, of housing in the county is holding us back. But it's part of a general trend where we're not getting as much private sector investment as we once did. We used to be a place that was growing rapidly. We would have suburban office centers going up in North Bethesda and Rockville and Gaithersburg, Silver Spring, uh, Germantown, all over the county. Uh, that is happening far less these days. And in fact, a lot of those centers are struggling. We have empty buildings. We do not have strong growth in high wage jobs. We have a broader growth in more modest paying jobs, but we don't match the kind of growth in high wage jobs that we once enjoyed and that really built the foundation of this community. And having significant barriers to investment in our economy is part of that problem. Uh, other communities in the region don't have it and they are able to capture more investment and more benefit as a result. The most significant and dramatic policy that uh, embodies that problem is the housing moratorium. We have both a housing shortage and a housing moratorium, uh, which is something that we really need to, to fix. Um, but the, I understand the logic of, of, of housing moratoriums. I, I truly do. I think we can all think about a crowded school, our own child's school perhaps, the school we went to, and think, well, why should three more children be added to that school as a result of a you know, a new apartment building going up in, in, in the community. Um, but, you know, as logical as that sounds, it really does more harm than good to this community to prevent that, that apartment building from moving forward. Uh, and I'll give you just an example here. Um, you know, downtown Silver Spring, where my own children go to school in very crowded schools. The development of downtown Silver Spring has been an absolute game changer for this county. It has made us an incredibly, it has created an incredibly desirable, you know, enjoyable, fun place that people come to from all over the region, all over the county. Um, and yet parts of downtown Silver Spring have been in moratorium. Councilmember Rice and I worked together on legislation that tried to wrestle with some small aspect of that. Uh, we benefit far more from the development of downtown Silver Spring than you know, we are inconvenienced by the marginal addition of children that might be in those apartment buildings. And in fact, when you look at the numbers of the more than 1,000 new students that have been added to the Blair High School in recent years, 
only 50 come from the development. The rest of them come from existing neighborhoods. That's really where children come from. And when we hold back development that is replacing empty parking lots, you know, empty office buildings, or just simply outdated, you know, buildings, when we hold that back in the name of school capacity, we end up with a community that is stale, you know, that lacks the amenities, the, the, the dynamism, the change, the investment, uh, the progress of other communities around us. And so a better way to deal with school crowding is to build more school capacity. That comes from having a dynamic economy that is has a strong revenue base where we have strong tax revenues uh, coming in from all kinds of different revenue sources. That is how we build a strong uh, school construction program that can meet the needs of our school system. Uh, and without putting ourselves into contortions and twists around moratoriums and specific school areas and, and trying to change the school board's recommended construction program in order to meet that policy objective. So, um, you know, the hard truth is that a moratorium does not slow enrollment growth. It, it, it's really the neighborhoods that generate enrollment growth. But when we hold back the development that we're seeking, we end up with a less appealing, less enjoyable, less uh, a lower quality of life for everyone. It's just the moratorium does more harm than good. So the one of the signal uh, recommendations of the policy and of the committee's recommendation is to not uh, continue with a housing moratorium. Um, and I think we just feel like go up and down Rockville Pike, you know, see the empty dirt lot, you know, near the White Flint Mall and the you know, see the, the, the empty parking lots uh, over the metro stations. You know, there there are there is a very real cost to putting up barriers to investment in our economy. Uh, we've been paying that price. We've got to reset this and, and develop a dynamic in this county that can really support our future prosperity, our future growth and our and really a sense of, of optimism and positivity. So uh, there you have it that, you know, there's a, a big, a big picture here, but um, the, the, we'll, we'll, we can walk now through the council packet and uh, thank you for giving me the floor to make those comments. Before, thank you. Before I do that, I'm going to turn to the other co-chair, council member Navarro, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, want to thank the planning board, uh, the administration, and all my colleagues, but specifically the Fed Committee and the GO Committee members who have been um, working on this issue. I think that um, this particular SSB um, conversation has been very timely. Um, you know, last year when we adopted the economic development platform that I introduced as council president, identifying these quadrants of transportation, housing, uh, workforce development, and then business uh, creation, expansion. The reason why that was so important is because I know that the council in particular recognized that in order for us to stay true to this promise of Montgomery County being a welcoming place and a place where quality of life um, was always improving, that in order for us to stay, to stay true to that concept, uh, we needed to get serious about this issue of um, economic development, uh, of creating opportunities for all, of creating neighborhoods that um, stay true to the promise of, you know, activated walking communities that looked at issues like transit-oriented development, looked at ways for us to attract young professionals, that looked at ways for our people who maybe want to downsize, have an opportunity to live in areas that are walkable um, as well. And there's just so many elements that, um, you know, the people are seeking. Uh, and the work with the Council of Governments, uh, although it was not easy, um, you know, to spend a year and then getting all these different jurisdictions in the region to agree, um, I think every jurisdiction has a different story and they all agreed to adopt these um, updated targets for particular reasons that fit their story. For us, I think it has to do with recognizing 
that we have so many assets in our county, but that we have got to deploy those assets in a way that makes sense. Uh, and I tend to believe that, of course, one you know big thing we don't talk about a lot is that when we start talking about the issue of student generation, et cetera, um, we do know that we have many families that have to share housing, just like we actually have like teachers that have to share housing. And the promise of building more housing is not just because, you know, it fits with these goals, but, you know, you cannot on the one hand say that you are for um, dignity and opportunity for families that are working, you know, class families, and that, and then be against the generate, you know, creation of more housing. The reality is that those people who are sharing housing would love to have access uh, to their own homes, but because we have somehow twisted ourselves into a pretzel and created conditions that have stood in the way of generating more housing units. That has had an impact on these families. And now with the pandemic, you know, that has been exacerbated. And so this is not a sort of, um, you know, pro this against that kind of exercise. This, I think, has, has made all of us, um, has made all of us really cognizant of the fact that we have got to step back and sometimes put ourselves in the shoes of many people that, we may not necessarily um, be too familiar with. Uh, and at the same time, look at the macro picture of what it means to put this county back on track uh, when it comes to economic development. It's very clear. If we're not able to do that, we're not going to have the amount of revenue necessary to not only preserve but expand the high quality of life in our county. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so to me, this particular opportunity is um, allows us to create, to update a template that would best fit with the situation that we are facing right now. And it is about uh, growth. It is about, uh, you know, seeking ways to expand our tax base and revenues, while it's also about making sure that we address the needs of those who have not had access to the opportunities that many of us have enjoyed. So having said that, I just want to say that in terms of how we treat some of the things that are incorporated in this um, SSB in terms of, for example, recordation taxes and things like that, you know, we're going to have to also grapple with the notion that perhaps this exercise means that we are incentivizing to a great degree because if we didn't need to incentivize, that would mean that things were fine, you know? Um, and we look around, and it was mentioned by Council Member Reamer, you look around so many different areas of the county and things have not been realized the way it was, you know, proposed or envisioned in the past. Uh, and so that might mean that, you know, we as county government are going to have to step up with a stronger sort of incentive package with a higher level of incentive uh, packages in order to spark some of these kinds of opportunities throughout the county so that then when we can that way we can realize um, some of those uh, return on investment vis-a-vis -vis the impact taxes and property taxes income taxes and things like that i mean that's just the way it works there is no free lunch as a lot of people say but when we're talking about positioning the county this is something we may have to, you know, consider. Um, before we get into the conversation, I also wanted to flag that, you know, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee did not get into the conversation of recordation taxes because, in, to be honest, we didn't feel like we had um, the full picture in front of us. There are a lot of puts and takes, different decisions that have been made by the committees. And so we really wanted to first have a sense of, like, where are we? Um, in relationship to what the planning board um, recommended and where is that delta and then have options, you know, scenarios. We did this in 2016 when we actually raised the um, recreation tax. We had a lot of different scenarios that the council can then um, entertain and address, including the option of no increase in the recreation tax. 
right? I mean, so we want to be able to have scenarios. In the interest of the timing, uh, the conversation that I had with Council President Katz was, you know, let's track and see how things go. These bills, of course, are not subject to the same sort of timeline restriction as the SSB, but GEO would be happy um, to, to go over all of these options when staff is ready. If for some reason there are like timing, you know, agenda issues or whatever, if it wants to go back to the full council, I'm not opposed to that. I'm trying to be as collaborative and accommodated as possible with this process because I know there's a lot on everybody's plate. Um, but I just wanted to flag that that is the reason why um, GEO committee felt that we were kind of doing this in a piecemeal kind of way and we didn't really have the full picture to understand and be able to decide that, hey, okay, you know, the goal is X and yes, we may be foregoing X, but is that for us to consider as an incentive of sorts or is that something we just cannot forego and therefore we need to do Y? So all of these things are still um in flux and we just wanted to make sure that we got to a point where we had almost like a reconciliation type of situation where we can look at this uh, holistically. Uh, so having said that, again, I just really want to thank the planning board, um, Mr. Anderson. This is, I know, been a pretty, pretty amazing step forward. I think the planning board responded to what the council has been saying quite a bit about we're going to have to be bold. You know, we want something that obviously uh, fits uh, where we are. Uh, today, respond to the conditions on the ground today, and um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty pretty ecstatic about you know some of the things that are, that are contained in this particular um, proposal. I yield back to you, Council President. Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Beck wants to speak. Ms. Beck, we're going to if you could be as concise as possible, please. We need to be doing our Air, um, be hearing from our staff as quickly as we can. But please, yeah. you're next. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think Ms. Navarro was absolutely correct. Uh, this has been very difficult to quantify. There are so many different decisions that have compounding effects. But my main point is just to simply make uh, known my concerns that we may be heading in a direction that will be decreasing our revenues for sure with impact taxes with where we stand at the moment. And I am also concerned that our revenues may be less stable with some of the recommendations that have been made. Some of the other patterns that have been in place have made it easier to predict money and, and project what we could have to afford. Uh, I think the other reason I'm very concerned about this is because of the Build to Learn Act. That is, uh, in theory, going to be providing significant increases in state aid. And what many people may not fully understand is that we are, unless we change the law or change our patterns, at risk of not being able to use all that money because we may not have enough local funding for match. To, gen to leverage the state aid. So I don't wanna do anything that puts us in a, in a difficult situation with that. And quite honestly, with recordation taxes, if we were going to increase it, I'd love to see it go there to help leverage that additional state aid. So those are my primary concerns. I know um, we've been working diligently with planning staff and council staff to come up with those better projections. We'll be happy to do whatever scenarios and I know Pam will make it clear which items are having an effect of reducing revenues, and we'll have numbers for you at a later session. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to turn to uh, Ms. Dunn and Dr. Orland. Um, and I know, uh, Glenn, you and I have had the conversation, so when you're speaking, if you could also go through the time frame and explain what when we need to be doing uh, <laughs> this and uh, the, about the uh, – that it does not necessarily, and I want to put words in your mouth, I know you'll have a few of those yourself, but uh, that this does not, that we don't necessarily have to uh, uh, do the impact tax and the recordation tax under the same time frame as the other parts of SSP. If you could please explain that as well. I don't know who's leading this off, and Ms. Dunn, Dr. Orland, who's leading it off? Well, I'll answer your, your question, but okay. Ms. Dunn is really going to lead the discussion today because I think we're starting with schools. Um, the law requires that if the council is going to adopt a new SSP, it needs to do so by November 15th. Um, 
And in this case, actually, because November 15th is a Sunday, it could be November 16th. Uh, however, if it's not done by then, then the old SSP remains in effect. And so if you want to make any changes from that point and not wait another four years, you need to introduce another, uh, you need to introduce an SSP amendment to do whatever it is that you want to do. That starts another process. Uh, we need 45 days for the uh, planning board and the executive to weigh in, hold a public hearing, and then start again with work sessions and action. Uh, there is no such limitation on the impact tax bill or the recordation tax bill. I think it's the normal 18-month um, uh, period for any kind of a bill. Um, when the planning board sent over all this whole package of, of actions back in August, uh, the intent was to try to have them all adopted at the same time um, because they're so interrelated, but there's no uh, legal requirement that you do so. Thank you very much. And with that, Ms. Dunn, you've been more than patient. Could you please begin? Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the way we're going to uh, approach reviewing this with the council is we're going to start with uh, the school side of things. Um, you can see that in the packet that's all included in what we call part one. Um, and the first part of even part one is going to cover two issues that um, have implications for not just how the SSP is conducted, but how impact taxes would be calculated. Um, and those two issues are one involves um, how we consider multifamily structures um, and the second being whether we have regional student generation rates. And so I'll go into those in more detail in a minute, but I just wanted to give you sort of a bigger picture overview. We're gonna cover those two issues because they cross cut both um, things related to taxation and things related to the subdivision staging policy implementation. Um, after we cover those two cross cutting issues, we're gonna walk through mostly just subdivision staging policy as it relates to schools. Once we get through all of the recommendations related to subdivision staging policy in schools, we'll then go through the impact tax um, recommendations related to schools. Um, then we'll turn it back over to do the transportation related SSP recommendations. Um, and then uh, recommendations related to impact taxes that affect both transportation and schools. Um, and then I think ultimately uh, recordation tax and the name kind of goes back and forth a little bit, but that's sort of the broad picture. So to get started, I just wanted to focus this. Um, it has been a tremendous amount to go through. The planning board draft is ambitious and interesting, and um, I, I want to thank them all for sending up a great um, product and something that's been um, very intellectually challenging to bring to the council and explain. Um, there's a lot of pieces to it, and there are a lot of things that are interrelated. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great work. So we'll get started. The first has to do, just so you set the stage to, subdivision staging policy is done every four years. And it really is the rules by which we consider whether the infrastructure is adequate for the planning board to approve new development. New development does a preliminary plan of application. Sometimes it's site plan and occasionally a building permit will go to DPS where there has to be a finding of adequate public facilities. And the SSP itself and the resolution you will eventually pass, those are the rules by which it operates. So you're deciding, you know, under which rules will we say development can move forward? What, what is adequate? Um, and um, I think with that, and then impact taxes, as you know, yes, they're not on the same time frame, and that's really because impact taxes aren't about adequacy. They're about a payment into a system that exists and that needs funding and that is um, something we want to continue to have at a high quality in the county, but it's not about whether the infrastructure itself is adequate for new developments. So they're, they're slightly separated, but they're intertwined. Um, the first thing, multifamily structures. Um, currently today, uh, impact taxes and subdivision staging policy, the evaluation of an application for new development or in master planning, um, there are four structure types that are evaluated to do those things. Uh, there's single family detached housing, single family attached is how we refer to it, but you'll think of that as townhouses or duplexes. Um, there's multifamily low rise, which we think of as garden apartments, and they're multifamily high rise. So there's four structure types. Um, and based on those, we have student generation rates. Um, these come from um, planning, works with Montgomery County Public Schools. The county a school system is great. They provide student level data with address and grade level and all other private information is removed. Um, and with that data, the planning department can come up with the student generation by structure type of 
units all across the county. And so they can evaluate those um, by any number of ways. They can do it by geography um, and certain different things. Um, and these generation rates have been in place since 2003. It used to be that they were based off of the census update survey. So it was survey data that was used to create the generation rates. But this new method where there's actual enrollment data and the planning department um, does a great job of going through it, uh, verifying it, and then establishing the student generation rates um, has a high level of accuracy. Um, and uh, so if you go to the, it's the third page of the um, memo, we have the rates from um, 2003, 2007, 2016, current rates, and then in the planning board draft, the rates. Um, and the reason I showed the rates is the first recommendation in the uh, planning board's draft is to combine multifamily um, structure types um, into just one multifamily rate. And the primary motivation of that, it has to do with data and the labor intensity of, of maintaining these different structure types. Um, but I wanted to get a really clear view of, is there really a difference between the low rise and high rise? If we combine multifamily into one structure type, what are we losing? And if you look carefully, every single year from 2003 to today, um, the difference in student generation from low rise and high rise is about two and a half to three times different. Um, you can see that between the um, single family housing types, they're very similar. They're almost one, they're in, you know very close together and that's been consistent since 2003 but the high rise and low rise have been consistently different. Um, and while I think that the data gathering and the, and the efforts for the data are, um, are challenging, I think that, that they have a really good um, base with which to work. They've been doing this since 2013. So they've already evaluated much of the multifamily housing stock that exists in the county. Um, obviously, if students move into some older units, older structures that are already in the system that will need evaluating. And then obviously you evaluate as you move forward. But again, I think in current time, we have very good data. Um, so this went to the committee, the joint committee reviewed it and um, they had a unanimous um, vote on this to retain the low and high rise multifamily structures moving forward. There's any questions on that? I, I have no questions at this point, so. Uh, believe me, this is not a shy group, Pam. If they have a question, they let us know. Is okay. Councilman Robert on to present a question? No? Okay. We're, okay. we're good um, for the moment. We're good okay. for the moment. Thank you. Um, and this is a place where I will make a note, um, and as Beck had mentioned, I will let you know, by combining, um, moving from combining the rates, okay, and currently today they aren't, but having the two separate rates means that you have a higher rate for the low-rise unit than you have for the high-rise unit. Garden apartments do tend to generate more students than the high-rise units do. So um, if you had just one rate, uh, that rate would be in between, right? You'd have a one rate, and so it would, in a sense, those low-rise units would be subsidizing the high-rise units. They, they generate more students, and we basically look at this cost of a student seat, which is the same across the county. Countywide, it costs the same to build an elementary school or a middle school or a high school. Um, that's the basis. It's what does it cost to construct a student seat? And then we take these generation rates. So, um, so there could be a, a slight decrease, or there will be a de could be a decrease in revenue um, from what the planning board has recommended um, for this recommendation. But it, but currently today we have four structure types. Um, the next part of this um, looked at. I'm just going to find my place here. Um, whether the data for the high rise should be used from data sets from 1990 to present or all years of data. And I know this gets really technical and into the, into the weeds with some of this for some of the council members, but um, currently today, and this was a decision made in 2016, when the student generation rates for multifamily were calculated, they just used all the data in, um, in the county. They just said, okay, all multifamily structures, uh, where the students live, what's the student generation rate, and in this time, planning staff has spent a lot of time evaluating many different scenarios with student generation rates and the relationship of those rates to each other. And they looked at the history and the year built of much of the multifamily housing stock and looked at it in detail, looked at it by unit, looked at it in decades. And what they found was from 1990 and every decade, 1990s, the 2000s, 2010s, um, multifamily housing especially low rise, 
didn't act at all in student generation like the, the very early structure types. So the ones built in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And I think most of us can understand that makes a lot of sense. We think of those very, very old ones as being much, much larger, probably accommodating very decent sized families and possibly two families, right? So they, on average, would generate more students. But the purpose of the SSP is not to say, are we making sure that we capture all students that are enrolled or could be generated in the county for enrollment purposes? That is MCPS's job and that information is available to them. The purpose of the SSP is to say, how are we gonna treat development applications moving forward and how do we plan our master plans, right? It's about forward looking. So if we have three decades of data that say, multifamily really acts in this way, it doesn't produce nearly the students that you might consider if you look at the whole universe of it. it, it we should consider only using the data from 1990 forward. Because for three decades, it has basically been that multifamily housing produces X number of students. Um, so that's been the recommendation from the planning board that the data be segregated from 1990 on for the multifamily. Um, council staff agreed with that and the joint committee also unanimously agreed with that. Okay, thank you. Council member Rice, did you want to speak? So I guess I can chime in now. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of interesting. I wanted to uh, also refer to something that Ms. Beck said about the concern about Build to Learn Act. Look, Montgomery County's had a long history of forward funding projects, uh, and that has continued. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why we fought in Annapolis for the Build to Learn Act. And so I think that, again, recognizing the amount of contribution that we've had up until this point, uh, there certainly is no question we'll be able to accelerate projects far beyond what we've been able to do before. Now, with that being said, look, when it comes to generation, and again, I've had many conversations about this with many of you. I've publicly stated this a number of times. When we look at the habits, and I think Councilmember Navarro uh, highlighted on this in her comments, um, it, it really is one where we look at the progression of people as they go through this county uh, and certainly start off as renters and then they aspire to own a starter home and then go from there to a single family home. And we should provide every opportunity and on-ramp for them to do all of those kinds of things. And so realistically, that's where you see a lot of student generation because as my family did and started in a starter home, it actually started and began in an apartment and then went from there through the progression. And we've all seen that with uh, the majority of our own individual lives. Um, that's pretty much what we see. And so it really is one where it's a no brainer. And I think Councilmember Reamer said this about uh, in Blair Cluster, uh, the school that I attended, my alma mater, um, that, that that there it's the same thing. You don't see the generation coming from new development. It's mainly from existing. Uh, part of the reason why is because our homes are so daggone expensive. And so it's really hard to buy a new home. I know I tried. Uh, my wife and I tried. The only time we were able to is in our very first entry level home uh, where we could actually buy new and never bought new since then uh, because it's expensive. And so from that perspective, I really think that we have to understand that uh, as a part of human nature. You know, formulas are one thing, um, you know, and I know that Jason's like, ah, but, <laughs> but I mean, human nature is another too. It really is. And so it's, it's important for us to understand and just follow that, uh, knowing that that's the direction that people go in. I think we've struck a good balance. Uh, I, 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 I truly do. I think that again, we try and capture as much as possible and look, it's up to this council if we do find that there are other revenue sources that we've left untapped that we need to look at, that we can do that. The SSP is not meant to be the perfect end all be all. That's why we have other CTAs that we pass all the daggone time uh, to make those kinds of decisions, right? And it doesn't limit us from doing that. And so if we see that there's revenue left on the table, if we do see that we're not capturing as much as we think we need, the, the council and future councils will be able to make those decisions. And I think that that that's what we have to trust also. We have to trust that this document becomes something that gives us some guiding principles. But at the end of the day, um, we also have the ability to put puts and takes and tweaks to this uh, to make it work for us. And I think that we can do that. Uh, I think we've shown over the years uh, we can do that. Uh, and so I, I just really look forward to it and think again from a school perspective that I think we found ourselves in a good place. Thank you, Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make an observation on this point because I thought it was just so uh, illustrative, um, and, and both as an example of the kind of um, you know, the problems that we were creating with the old policy, and and a, a testament to the 
very uh, sharp skills of our planning staff, which has the ability to look deeper into things. Um, if you, you know, it's clear now that housing that is like 50 years old has a lot more students than housing that is 25 years old. Um, you know, you look at the low rise or the mid rise, it's the same. It's, it's the older housing because it's, it's more affordable. Uh, that's where you're going to see more families moving. Makes perfect sense. It's just part of that progression, as was said. Um, so we have been charging impact taxes on these buildings based on the number of students that they're going to generate, not when they open, not in five years, not even in 20 years, but the number of students that they're going to generate in like 50 years. They're having to They've been having to carry the load of impact on the schools 50 years from now. And we wonder why housing is expensive to bring to market, as Councilmember Rice said. You know, we, we load up all of these expenses on housing. We don't get the housing that we want. It's very expensive. Median price of a new home, single family, $675,000 now. Home ownership for young residents under 35, historic lows. You know, substantially down from what it was 10, 15 years ago. Well, our impact taxes are part of that. You know, it's holding the market back from delivering the housing, holding back the investment that we need. And I thought this was actually one of the most pertinent examples, you know, trying to charge a housing, a, 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 you know, a development for its potential impact 50 years from now. That's an unfair burden to have to carry and it's counterproductive. Uh, and it's creating all kinds of other problems. So this was a terrific fix among many uh, in this policy. Thanks. Thank you. Um, do we actually have numbers, data that says that this is a 50 year fix? What are you basing that on? Well, we could ask council uh, planning staff to, to explain, but the point here was that housing that is pre-1990 has a different student generation rate than housing that is but post the, 1990. Well, I appreciate that, but first off, 1990 is not 50 years from today. It's and secondly, and secondly, uh, it, you have to do things based on the time you're doing them. I mean, obviously, apartments have changed the generation of student generation over over time, and depending on the apartment, and, and Councilman Fritz, I'll get right to you. But but I, I do believe that that you have to base things on something, and I don't well, know that those numbers are are so, as correct. Yeah. Well, they're clearly correct. Uh, you know what we're saying is you shouldn't have to pay impact taxes based on a student generation rate that is more than thirty years into the future. Okay. Well. First off, there again, even and and I'm in, in agreement with what is being suggested for the SSB on on for the students at this point. But I also believe that that you know a, a, a student, though we talk about the generation, property taxes do not pay for the student. This is just for the generation of building the buildings. It doesn't pay for them each year for the operating side. So I, I do think we have to keep that in mind. Though I am in favor of of the SSP the way it is written on and for this part. Council Member Friedson. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't want to get caught up in the 50 years in the future and, and, and that. I mean, I think it's a reasonable point. I think the, the bigger point here is the broader context of what we tried to do in the joint committees as the one person who's involved in every single one of these conversations since I uh, happen to be the one council member who serves on both committees of jurisdiction. Uh, I have had a front row seat to every single one of the conversations in committee. And the key here is we have better access to more specific data than we ever have before. And one of the main goals of this effort and this policy is to figure out what is the best way to use the data that we now have, that we have the, the luxury of. This is one of several examples of how we can disaggregate the data and make sure that we're actually doing what this policy is supposed to do, which is to charge for impact. You know, this is not supposed to be a revenue generating exercise. This is supposed to be a, an exercise to determine the impact and to ensure that the costs of that impact are adequately funded for 
appropriate and adequate public infrastructure, whether it's schools uh, or transportation infrastructure. This is one of several examples, and it makes sense. Since 1990, the lifestyle behaviors of the county have changed dramatically. Absolutely. The demographics of the county have changed dramatically. Absolutely. And because of all of those factors, the you know the, the student generation rates have been consistent since 1990 and are quite different pre-1990. And so the question is, should we be using uh, data from a bygone era that's no longer relevant and charging folks for impact that they don't have based on data that isn't theirs. And you know what we've tried to do in multiple occasions, and Council President Katz, as you've been part of many of these conversations, you know, I think we've done a an admirable job of trying to figure out and determine how to do that. And Mr. Sartori is on this, who's done a great job with just determining what that data uh, is from the planning uh, perspective. And you know, we haven't accepted all of the planning board's recommendations of this, but the, the larger context of what we try to do is to say, we no longer have to take a one size fits all approach with one cost because we know student generation rates based on housing types, based on geography, based on you know a lot of different factors. And we can use that data to target the impact to the folks who are actually making the impact as best as we can within a reasonable uh, you know framework. And I think that you know by and large based on where the joint committees have recommended, that's 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 what we have done. And I think have done a pretty good job of. Okay, thank you. So I don't know that I interrupted you, Mr. Reamer, or Council Member Reamer, but if I did, I apologize. Were you finished? You were, okay. So Ms. Dunn, were you finished this part? Um, yes, I am finished this part. It was uh, part A in the packet. Um, and I don't know how you wanna handle where the council as a body lands, if you're taking any type of um, direction as you move along, or you're going to come back to everything at some other point. I think we need to, and to I believe it was Councilmember Navarro who made the point, that, and, and others, not just Councilmember Navarro, but this really is so interrelated. I think we need to listen to it all and then come back to it at, at the end or near the end. I don't know that it'll be completely the end. But, but I think that would be the best uh, to, to figure this out. I mean, that was part of why we decided to wait for the recordation tax and, and other parts, because th this thing needs to fit together the way that it should be fitting together. So, so we, at this point, would move on, unless you had something in addition for this, for A, and we'd move on all the way to B. Councilmember, wait, wait, and let me just, Ms. Dunn, is that correct? Is that what you're? Correct. You said? Okay. Councilmember Reamer, please. Thanks. Just to your to your comment about process. I mean, I think if council members have questions about specific issues, surface them now. To your point, I think it would be fine to come back and then we can address anything that a council member wants to address uh, without necessarily having to walk through okay. every single decision point once again. Um, <laughs> You and I are in agreement on that. There's there's no need to reinvent this wheel, but I just want to make sure we got all four wheels on the on the vehicle before we we Can get. To ask here. Pam, is that what you? How did you did you envision yes. twelve votes at each step, or did you? Start um, I, I guess I sort of did, thinking that there's there's a lot to get through, um, and maybe we'll just leave it that maybe it doesn't have to be a strong straw vote one way or the other. But if there's a um, maybe a significant objection to something or um, an issue where if if, if the general census is not going along with what the joint committees or the committees have recommended that that be raised um, because I think we will have trouble getting through all of this if we keep revisiting it. Okay. Yeah. It's been suggested by, I, I had a suggestion that we do straw votes. Is the, what is the will of the council? Do you want to do straw votes or do you want to wait till the end? What do you want to do? I would think we should, to be honest. Uh, yeah. I see Council straw Member votes, you're saying? Yeah. Council Member Juwando? Yeah, I, would, I was just going to say, uh, having sat through most of this, and uh, I find myself on the other end of the vote a lot. I, I would like to discuss, discuss. Uh, I think those are good places where we should talk. I, whether we take straw votes now or not, I, I, I don't have a strong feeling on that, but I think it's important to discuss the areas where the Joint Committee didn't have full agreement uh, or... Uh, and then as Ms. Dunn was doing, I think going over very quickly the points, the decision points that were unanimous and just moving through those 
that's the way I, I think we could, that's why I would suggest, but. Okay. Right, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add that I think the expectation is, and I think we usually do this, to take straw votes after the joint committees and the committees have uh, made their recommendations um, and then, of course, if there are specific areas where there was disagreement, um, you know, then council members can chime in. There might be an amendment proposed or something like that. Um, but I worry that if we don't take straw votes, it's going to be very difficult to get to the to get through this process. I think the conversation about the taxes, those decisions. You know, once we're done with the straw votes and staff has an opportunity to figure out where we land, you know, maybe we can then do that piece. Um, but definitely, I think getting as much as you know possible through straw votes would be important, including the controversial issues. I mean, if you know, if if council members want to move something, we can also vote on that. Um, so anyway, that's that's okay. that would be my. Yeah. Okay, um, Councilmember Friedson, I think you had a hand up there. Yeah, no, I was just going to, I agree with what has been said. I think that there are some several items. Uh, there's a lot of universal agreement, and I think we can just explain what they are and move on unless any council member uh, has a concern. But as has been mentioned, just have staff, you know, quickly summarize uh, what that is. It's all very significantly written out in the packet uh, that both the public and council members can see and then spend most of the time, hopefully, on it, but I, I think we do need to take straw votes because if we have to come back and vote on each element of this, I mean, it's a huge package of policy uh, issues. And I think if we don't take it up one by one in straw vote, that it would make it very difficult to go back uh, and address it. So thank okay. you. And is anybody now objecting to straw votes? Are we okay to, to do the, what is an agreement for the straw votes? The, the, non, the non-controversial items. Um, so Ms. Dunn, if you'll lead us through that, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Before I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. President. I, I mean, I, I I would submit that even the controversial items. I mean, depending on how far we get today, but I mean, we need to discuss the, the controversial items as well, and then you know, um, have a robust conversation. Um, also. Um, so anyway, just wanted to to, okay. to, to share that. Agreed. Okay. The recreation okay. tax we're postponing until later, but everything else we should be able to take one step at a time. Okay, I hear you. Ms. Dunn, please lead us through. Okay, um, so we've just now covered two decision points that the joint committee made. The first one was um, they unanimously decided to retain the low and high rise multifamily structures as um, a unit of analysis for the impact tax and for the SSP. Okay, so now are we going, are we having motions? Or are we just gonna say, how are we gonna do these straw votes? If, if do it without objection, unless I, I would recommend that you you move them without objection when it's unanimous. Right. Okay. And then um, when it's not unanimous, you know, you could move the committee recommendation, and then a council member who may wish to, you know, have a different view. I think that at that point we would. All right. I think yeah. that's. Yeah, we can get to the good. item and then maybe ask if there are, you know, if anybody wants to speak on the item, if there are any questions and. Uh, and then once everybody speaks, then if there's no objection, we just move forward. Actually, I'm sorry, the yeah. chair's not supposed to make motions, right? So they are before us as motions already of the joint committee. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Back I guess it's all for a vote. Yeah. Right. Back in. So anyhow, Ms. Dunn, you, the first one, please, so that it's not any more confusing yes. than it is. Right. The first one was um, retaining uh, low-rise and high-rise multifamily structures. Okay, is without objection? It's without objection, okay. okay. Well, we're all the way uh, up to number two, Ms. Dunn. Yeah, we... we've only gone through two, so. Uh, yeah, the second yeah. one was using the data from 1990 to present in the evaluation of multifamily structures. Without objection? Okay, thank you. Okay, now we're on to new material, which is um, the designation of school impact areas. Um, there are two primary elements of the school's portion of the SSP that treat all areas of the county the same. Um, the one is that we have a countywide set of adequacy standards um, for school utilization, um, like the moratorium threshold, things like that are countywide currently. Um, the other is that we have um, impact taxes that are based on a countywide student generation rate. Um, what this next section is, is a, um, a proposal by the planning department 
Um, they currently look at student generation rates on a regional basis. Those regions have been constructed um, from information they received from MCPS, who has looked at these things regionally. So they are basically three regions of the county uh, based on clusters and the proximity of those clusters to each other. What the planning board is uh, proposing is to create student generation rates um, by three regions, but they did um, a very detailed and robust evaluation of characteristics of these areas to place them in these three regions. Um, three regions are Greenfield, Turnover, and Infill. That's how they've been named. But they're really based on um, housing growth, the type of housing, and enrollment growth. Um, and data that they determined um, metrics for each one of those three items, they gathered for um, all of these planning areas. They um, broke the county up into planning areas, neighborhoods, um, and then looked at these things. And then from this, they basically had indexed each of these planning areas into one of these three regions. Um, there's a map in their draft. It's on, um, I guess it's in the appendix on page 453. Um, and they have a map online, which is extremely useful. You can go to their website and it's an interactive map so you can look at these areas and other features of these areas. Um, and one of the other things they did, so the planning years were somewhat large, and what they noticed was, um, because they were based initially on census tracts, um, that the red uh, metro stations and the purple line stations um, were being labeled with the broader geography in which they occurred, um, and so they recommended pulling those out separately, um, and that's what the planning board recommended and the, and the committee agreed with. Um, when... Council staff looked at it. Uh, we asked planning just to include a different metric that was a little more forward looking and it had been based on the residential capacity analysis that they had recently completed. The board did not have access to that data when they reviewed the document. Um, and in that reevaluation, one thing that the committee um, agreed with was uh, pulling out the White Oak, what we're calling the White Oak redevelopment area separately. It had been initially included with Fairland uh, but we kind of expect it to be something that will be different in the way that it develops. We know that there's a, a potentially a huge uh, preliminary plan that will come forward for the White Oak, Viva White Oak area. So it's just been pulled out as a geography separately, not unlike other places in the county when they did the evaluation. Um, and on this one, the committee, um, they concurred with including the uh, Metro Station Purple Line policy areas as infill. Um, and four of uh, the five joint committee members agreed to the three um, areas that the planning department has put forward, the greenfield, the turnover, and the infill impact areas. Um, Council Member Jawando um, dissented on that one. Um, when the new metric was added for the residential capacity analysis, um, basically the greenfield uh, area disappeared from that analysis. Um, and so Council staff had recommended that there only be two areas, but that's the one that's before you now. Okay. Um, Ms. Beck. Yes, uh, I did just want to mention this is one of the areas where the, by, by breaking the county into regions, it does uh, end up in a situation where uh, great increases primarily in the Clarksburg area would be needed to offset significant rate reductions in other parts of the county. And basically, we will not achieve our revenue estimates if uh, Clarksburg development does not happen. So it's it's just one, one change that makes us more vulnerable. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Yeah, thank you. So um, I was a guest in that meeting. So of course, obviously didn't have a vote. But um, let me just say that, um, look, the greenfield area piece for me it, it 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 it's 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 very clear that it's going to have a negative impact on the clarksburg area in terms of affordability and that's one of the things that i've continued to say for a very long time um if we are to continue and i've been very consistent in terms of my messaging around uh creating affordable housing and affordable housing opportunities for folks and um clarksburg really does represent the last bastion of uh affordable housing here in montgomery county of new builds um, you know, and so from that perspective, it really doesn't make a lot of sense for us to treat this area uh, in this kind of manner that would drive up the cost uh, of housing in one of the last places where folks go that they're disconnected from um, mass transit, 
Um, they're disconnected from some of the roadways that we've said. They don't have all of the amenities, including a library. Uh, and oh, on top of that, we also want to make it more expensive for housing. Just don't think that it's a great policy for us to be pushing forward. And so uh, from that standpoint, I hope that folks certainly understand that. And, um, you know, I've, I've spoken ad nauseum to this before, so I don't think I need to go through uh, the details and hope folks would support that ideology. So I know that Councilmember Juwando wanted to speak to this too. And just as you said that, I got a text from Councilmember Juwando. He's a, he's a, a soothsayer. Councilmember Juwando, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Rice. Uh, so so uh, we spoke about this in committee. Um, I want to underscore the reason I, you know, landed on this side is, again, there was a reevaluation, which I want to have Ms. Dunn explain, uh, but I also concur, you know, we talk about step-up housing, we talk about the many people that move to the, you know, further out to get affordability um, or to, you know, different quality of life. I think one of the pe things people like about Montgomery County is the different types of living you can have. Um, I certainly push really hard as lead for libraries for the for to move up the Clarksburg Library. That's a service that we need up there uh, to to a point that was made. Uh, and I think this is just setting up a uh, uh, an unequal playing field for folks that are looking to move up, move around in and around the county uh, and trying to exact a, a higher price. Uh, and that's going to impact actually. I think have a reverse. It could potentially have a reverse impact on uh, the that movement and the very thing we're trying to achieve uh, is providing more housing at diff at, at, that's affordable. So I did want to ask Ms. Dunn, I think, because this is just a uh, dense stuff. Uh, if you could explain the point you mentioned briefly about why the re what happened when you did the reevaluation and what was included in that and, got, and why the basis for the recommendation to go to uh, infill and turnover and not have this third category. Oh, of course. Um, so when I recently, when I got the planning board draft and looked at it, um, as we've mentioned, it's a lot to go through. It was very impressive. Um, but the one thing that struck me when I looked at the map for the school impact areas was um, one, the sheer size of what was called the purple. It was colored in purple, but it was the Greenfield area um, up around Clarksburg. Um, and the explanation that it's where there was an expected um, a lot of development and that would be predominantly single family. And the single family part obviously we um, disagree with it. seems that's a lot of what does get built up in the Clarksburg area, though the town center does have multifamily. Um, but it really was about looking at, uh, the planning department has numerous maps and you can learn a lot and pull them up and look at um, ones where all the preliminary plans have already been approved. And if you, if you do that, you lay it over Clarksburg area and the Greenfield area, you'll see that like anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of the land area is covered by basically preliminary plans of development, development that's already come through the planning department. Um, and the data points they used, they used two when they were looking initially at this um, metric, was um, the change in housing growth from 2013 to 2018, so in the past, um, and then what was in the pipeline left unbuilt. Again, it's already been approved for development, so the SSP won't apply to it, but if it's unbuilt units, you can expect it to come forward and it will generate students. And if it is multi or single family housing, it'll there's a lot, um, but I really wanted to see if there was in existence some metric they could add to that analysis for that category that would be more forward looking. What can we expect in the future in Clarksburg if, if we're concerned that what's already occurred has covered a large portion of the area out there? Um, it is less greenfield than we'd like to think it is. So they had recently completed what's called the residential capacity analysis. And what that does, it looks at different areas of the county and says, what is the zoning capacity here? So how much can ever be built? What's the zoning capacity? And what's the difference then? What has already been built and what's in the pipeline? So if it's on the ground or it's already approved, you take that out of the zoning envelope and what's left is the delta. When you add that a metric for all the planning areas that were in their analysis, Greenfield changed from being called Greenfield to being called turnover because the the rate of growth or the amount of growth left was less important when right. you put it in context to its zoning envelope. Um, so that's how I had reached that maybe there were only two areas in the county in which student generation rates should be divided and there's infill and then there's everywhere else. And I think it's also important to note that 
appropriately so, and I think the planning board does a great job in pointing this out, in the type of multifamily housing we've been getting, and I have some proposals later on to try to incentivize a different type of multifamily housing, but in the most of the type we're getting, the student generation is lower, and in the turnover rates, which is the vast majority of the county, the turnover areas where, like we did, and like many people do, you purchase a home from some someone whose kids are gone, and then you have kids there. That is already recognized at a higher rate, um, and would continue to to be to do so. So I, I think taking what's in the pipeline, what's being built, and the points that Councilmember Rice and I made, I think it's appropriate to have the two the two versions. So I thank you for explaining that, uh, Ms. Tom. So that's where I am on this as well. Thank you. Uh, it's been suggested that we hear from the planning board uh, what their logic was on this. Mr. Casey, are you going to do that for us? I don't know. I I don't know if he is. I, I can I can try. Yeah, um, go ahead, Jason. Sure. Okay. For the record, uh, Jason Sartori with the planning department. Um, so, really, to kind of reiterate what uh, Ms. Dunn has said, we um, we would have liked to include the uh, the residential capacity data in our initial analysis. But when we were doing this months ago, uh, you know, initially we didn't have the data available yet. Um, you know, the idea was we wanted our designation of these areas to be reflective of what we've seen happen in the recent in the recent history and uh, recent past, but also be reflective of what we think could happen going forward. And when we did incorporate the data that was more reflective of the potential future, and that was the residential capacity data, uh, it did change the way some of these things fell out. Um, however, um, you know, it was just it, it, with the, the data that we had available at the time, it really made a place like Clarksburg look like what we've described as, you know, we've given the name Greenfield um, because that's the best way we thought it was the best description of it, where we're, we are seeing a lot of single family homes being built that are generating a lot of students. Um, and it's a lot of development happening, right? So a lot of development, a lot of single family homes generating a lot of students, which we is very similar to Greenfield. And so, but that's largely based on the history um you know there there are things that could change though so just taking a look at the residential capacity analysis that's based on existing zoning today now there's possible uh, possibility that some of these some of these areas that are currently zoned in a particular way may change um we've heard some conversation about that and that may increase the capacity going forward there and so it might from that perspective still be appropriate to keep it in the, a greenfield category okay council member reamer please Thanks. Um, yes, this is one where we had a lot of discussion. There was a little bit of a different view from council staff versus planning. Um, and we sided with what we heard uh, from Gwen Wright and Jason that the, for example, the ComSat, you know, there's talk about more development at ComSat, that there are properties in the Clarksburg area that may yet develop. Um, and so I thought council staff did a very, um, you know, is it a very astute analysis of capacity? Uh, what has developed, you know, relative to the capacity and recommended, you know, a different approach, but we ultimately agreed with the kind of the, the pipeline sentience that planning staff had, uh, you know, looking to the future and saying, we think Clarksburg may yet remain uh, is appropriately categorized as Greenfield, you know, for the, at least for the near future. Um, obviously, this is a quadrennial policy, so we might find four years from now, you know, we, we reach a different conclusion. Um, I would also say that, well, anyway, I'll just leave it there. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that if I could, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but okay. I just wanted to make it clear that the, both the planning staff and the planning board continue to believe that this was recommendation was was a sound one, we're not digging our heels on it. I think the main point is with respect to the moratorium, if you impose a moratorium in any other part of the county other than Clarksburg, it's crystal clear that you're stopping a lot of development but not stopping very many students. In Clarksburg, there's at least an argument that based on the data that we've seen, there's still quite a lot of students being generated per unit of development. But really the main point here was to try to explain 
the principal basis on which the, both the board and staff believe that the moratorium in general is founded on premises that just don't hold today. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This, these are my first comments. So let me just begin by um, thanking very much both committee chairs. Um, uh, my chief of staff sat in and listened to all of the respective sessions and has recently briefed me over a couple of days on what uh, transpired in the discussion and also do want to echo and commend the planning board staff um, for their creativity, for um, looking at uh, addressing a, a variety of issues. And I look forward to, to discussion as, as it evolves. And this is my first rodeo when it comes to subdivision staging policy. And so uh, I'm, I'm, th there's a lot to learn here. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to dig into this. But I do just have a general question. Uh, and I'm sure this was addressed in some form during the committee discussion. But the world has changed. Uh, in the last seven months in ways that are difficult to process. Um, and it's impossible now to uh, completely plan ahead. And I think this is just one example as we talk about uh, data. And I'm just curious as to, and, and it, there's no perfect answer here um, because we're all sort of adjusting to this new reality um, that we see. But if you look at New York, for example, which is um, months ahead of us and where they are with the pandemic, um, there has been uh, a significant shift in their real estate market and um, a lot of folks moving out of the city uh, into the suburbs and in those areas. And so I'm just curious as to how or if um, this new paradigm that we are in, this new world that we are in, uh, can and, and was uh, taken into account as we've made these various recommendations, or if, honestly, they're just there's only so much you can predict, um, you know, given given everything that, that is before us. So I don't know if council staff um, could begin uh, answering that question. And I, I wanna thank you, Ms. Dunn also, um, and council staff who I know have dug into this. I found the packet incredibly helpful. Um, and for a first timer uh, going through this, um, especially helpful. So, um, but if you could maybe begin by answering that sure. question, Ms. Dunn, and certainly to the committee chairs, and to the planning board, if, if you would like to respond as well, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, so I think the one thing that comes to mind is, first of all, you know, planning um, is required to send the draft up. They had done a bulk of their work, probably by the time anyone knew that the pandemic situation was going to be here for a while. So I had sort of no foresight to be able to really include that part of it in their analysis. What I would say is what we're doing today is at least setting us up to be more relevant than we were four years ago. If we were to choose to do nothing, we would be basing everything we're doing related to the SSP on stuff that was created four years ago. So at a minimum, I think just by updating the document and moving forward, we're at least coming to current terms today. Now, the council may decide in a year or two that our world in Montgomery County looks very different and what should we relook at? We may have a whole different work program that we might wanna consider in a year or two years, you know, based on where we are today. But I don't think because we know what that's going to look like quite yet, you know, it, it can really be incorporated. But I think I think it's not inappropriate to move forward with where we are right now. Yeah, and, and I think we should move forward. Um, I just was curious as to how or if, and, and you just responded beautifully, that there is an opportunity for us, um, if at such time things change dramatically, for us to reevaluate mm -hmm. as we would on the capital budget, as we would anything. on the operating budget, yeah. or anything for that matter. So there is a a nimbleness to this uh, that I think is important, relevant, but I just needed to hear that and, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? So where are we on this topic? Um, so where I think we've landed is that we are, um, we are making the decision about one, the committee was unanimous about um, Characterizing metro station policy areas and purple line policy station areas yep. in Phil. That can be a straw vote. Okay. Is that objection? That's without objection. Okay. Good. Um, and then the next one was the one we did spend just some more time talking about was whether there should be um, three school impact areas, Greenfield, Turnover, and Infill, or whether there should be two school impact areas. And the a majority vote from the joint committee was that there were three. There were three. I know Councilmember Juwando, go ahead, Councilmember Juwando was 
was not in agreement with that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. Councilman Rice and I, I mean, there's a there's a recommendation. So I will make I can make a motion. We could vote on the motion and then take the committee agreement. I'll make a motion that we go to turnover and uh, infill and not and only have two. Second. And, and candidly, I'm in agreement with, with you two on that. I really am. I, I think that we are changing what people can afford to do and how they can afford to do it. And so I'm in agreement with that. But so we have a motion for an amendment. Um, all those in favor of the amendment. Oh, go, go ahead, Hans. We discussed. Yeah, we, we yeah, have, we've discussed a bit, but um, I think I'll direct this to Pam. Um, talk to us about the implications of this. You know, I, I will say that this in the initial formulation was also related to the issue of more moratorium. Yeah. Um, and, well, can I, yeah. And so the planning board's recommendation was not only designating this area as Greenfield, but also retaining a moratorium policy uh, for Greenfield areas. Mm -hmm. And the committee did not recommend joint committee, joint committee? Mm -hmm. Fed. Fed. Did not recommend, I'm, I'm lost on the, when we were joint, it's all blending together. The committee did not recommend uh, adopting a moratorium for Greenfields. Um, but there, so the remaining distinction is about taxes, right? T uh, Pretty much. So two things. So the remaining distinction would be that um, you would have those regional student generation rates. They would cause by nature of the fact that they're higher student generation rates uh, would cause the higher impact tax rates in the Greenfield area. And they do go up. Um, and it would, um, but th those higher generation rates would also be used for development applications or for master planning in that area. If we don't see master planning in that area anytime soon, that part of it's probably pretty um, low on the priority list uh, and development applications that would come through in that area would get the higher student generation rate. Um, but without the moratorium, you would then have two areas. You'd have infill and turnover. You would have only then two differentiations in, in um, impact taxes across the county rather than the three areas. Um, I think that will look different. Um, and then that's the main thing. It, it really is that the, if you want to jump ahead, the Fed committee on moratorium had a, um, a committee majority say that moratorium should should be eliminated countywide. We took a first vote. Should we have countywide? Should we, you know, the, the planning boards was a regional uh, moratorium. It said only in this area should there be moratorium. And the committee talked about it at length and said, if we have moratorium, it should be countywide. Um, but we think there are more negative impacts to the county for moratorium than, than benefit. And therefore, they eliminated it. So that's where you are. If you moved away from a greenfield designation, you would um, have slightly different impact tax rates for the, mostly the turnover area um, would probably go up a little bit, um, but it's already gone down quite a bit. Um, yeah. Okay, very good. So uh, the, we have a motion and it's been seconded. Yep, um, anyone else want to speak? Uh, well, I'll speak, to, I'll speak to it, I guess. I thought you were, but <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if I was, or if I was asking questions. Uh, okay. I, um, well, I support the committee recommendation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think we based it on the planning board's expectation of the kind of development that's coming there in the coming years. So uh, it, it was all tied together. Um, thanks. Okay. Anybody else to the amendment? Council Member Navarro. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think this has been a really great uh, conversation, but it speaks to the fact that we are doing things on different committees, so it's kind of tough. Um, I'm glad that the Fed committee did vote in terms uh, for the elimination of the moratorium. But I think that, I mean, at least for me, the the focus was on this issue of student generation and also the adequate, um, you know, infrastructure dollars. And so if, if we're shifting to accept the fact that the planning board has updated their analysis on student generation, that it made sense to me that we would actually continue, you know, keep a different um, zone there because, of course, we need the resources. I mean, it speaks to, to 
we were saying earlier that especially in that part of the county, there has been, you know, challenges in terms of um, our ability to move forward with the needed infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so, so to me, it, it, it made sense that if we are going to eliminate moratorium everywhere, it, the least that we can do is maintain um, this differentiation because the data that was shared um, did speak to the notion that, um, you know, it's, if you have more students, if also you have more need for infrastructure because we don't have a lot of transit infrastructure over there, et cetera, then uh, this this would have, you know, it, it will have an impact. So, so anyway, so I support the committee's, uh, the joint committee recommendations. Okay, council member Rice, did you wanna speak again? I, okay. Yeah, so um, to that point that council member Navarro just made, I mean, the reality is this is look, uh, CCT isn't coming because of this uh, and the additional revenue, um, you know, uh, M83 isn't coming because of this and additional revenue. Um, the things that the up county has asked for and needed still aren't gonna come because we're having a differential. All it's gonna do is just make housing more expensive for people who wanna live in the up county. And again, this is, this is a strong message. I think that we have to be very careful uh, about what it is that we're sending uh, as a message to Clarksburg and the up county in general when we say that we're gonna make it more expensive for you to live here in this area than some of the other areas of the county. I agree with you wholeheartedly that, yeah, we need to have additional revenue, but we've always, the council has always been creative about how to make sure we're spreading that equitably throughout the entire county, uh, not just relying on one area of the county to make payment for itself. Um, you know, And so that's, that's where my concern has always been uh, it's always been one in which uh, looking to Clarksburg to pay for Clarksburg when Germantown and Clarksburg residents pay for Silver Spring and pay for Wheaton and pay for Rockville and pay for Potomac. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it really just doesn't make sense. And so um, from that perspective, I certainly understand, and, you know, I'm chair of the Education and Culture Committee. I certainly know all too well about the challenges we have when it comes to overcrowding. But I do think, again, to Ms. Beck's point, um, we have a lot of things that are happening when it comes to making sure that we can um, uh, gain additional revenue uh, for our school system, especially when it comes to construction. I mean, we have the brand new Seneca Valley High School that still has capacity. Um, so we already have a high school and we have a board of education that has finally taken the step of doing some redistricting uh, and making sure that we can actually build on that. Uh, so from that perspective, I think again, um, this is something in which we are in new times. We're in new times where we have a school board who's committed to doing very difficult things uh, to try and make sure that we can alleviate uh, some of the challenges when it comes to overcrowding. We have a general assembly who's actually done some great work in terms of understanding that we need additional revenue to support our schools, something that we've had to forward fund for decades. Uh, and so from that perspective, I think that we don't lose anything. Um, and in fact, we gain a more affordable housing in an area that we know needs it. And so I think that that's really, you know, what this is about. And I just want to be very clear that for me, this isn't a trade-off. Um, it isn't like we're losing so much for the things that we gain. And we always try and make sure that we make these decisions based on, you know, what our policies or public policies are for greater gain. And I think that, again, the whole mention ideology around that missing middle um, that we had these huge conversations about. Um, that's what this is. And so, you know, when I think about my cousin who, you know, lived in Clarksburg, um, you know, she's she was a single mom and had a child and that's where she moved, you know. Um, th these are the kinds of things that are out there um, that are available for folks. And we have to be reminiscent of that. Uh, and that I hope is gonna lead our decision when it comes to how we address this in the future. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Jawando. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, you know, I, I also, I just, I wanna underscore a couple of those points and just l lift something up for those. I can only imagine following this conversation and you weren't in the commit joint committees, it's kind of difficult, but uh, I can see Gabe like, you know, <laughs> another, but so if you go to two turnover and infill, we're already saying that which I point I agree with from the planning board that turnover creates more of the students and those rates should be higher. Okay, and we're already doing that uh, slightly higher, but, but lowering them overall, but still higher than infill, right? Higher than infill. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I know Ms. Beck raises a very important point about 
the general lowering here that is going to impact the stability of revenue. But another point, I think you might have made this point, Ms. Beck, we talked about it in committee, was that if you if you make it more expensive to uh, and you have a higher rate in Clarksburg, uh, you could actually disincentivize the very growth in housing that you want. Um, and and so I just think we and then compound the revenue challenges of an already lowered uh, tax rate that we're doing uh, for for the for the turnover and infill areas. And so I think it, it, it's not and I agree with Mr. Rice, it's not fair to say now, you know, you got to do it on your own and you're generating. They're still going to pay for the students they generate. There's going to be the test every year. We'll decide or if there's more than one test uh, and they're still going to pay for turnover. So I, it's not like they're getting, you know, anyone's getting a free pass. I just I think we want to be very careful about the messaging is a great point, but also the disincentive we could create for some of the most affordable housing. So that's why I think it's better to look at this uh, as two parts of the whole county, which is a very strong basis. And then when you look at the in, the what's in the pipeline, I think, again, emphasizing, Ms. Dunn did great work using planning board data and, and other data to say that what's in the pipeline, it moves it into the turnover category. Um, and so I, I think we just have to realize that as well. So I, I just wanted to emphasize those points. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Reno. Thank you. Uh, I think Councilmember Rice made some important points about housing in Clarksburg, and I know Councilmember Juwan has made this as well. Like, Councilmember, it is really important housing stock. Uh, you know, so many young families move there, no question about it. And it is, uh, you know, I won't call it affordable, but it's more affordable, right? It's still brand new and expensive, but it it is more affordable. And I know a lot of people who live in Clarksburg, as we all do. Without it, we would really be missing something in this county. There is no question about it. And I think we all need to think about that when we think about housing in general, uh, because I think, you know, we did adopt a very strict policy around ground, you know, essentially stormwater runoff and impervious surface and everything, especially for, of course, 10 mile Creek watershed. But Clarksburg is, you know, a community that is unique in Montgomery County. It is uh, essential. Um, and I don't think we would be as great a community without it. So I I'm a big fan of Clarksburg, uh, which might sound funny coming from, you know, people sometimes think I might not feel that way or something because it's not, not yet on a transit line, although we hope it will be. I think Councilman Rice is correct about the mega projects. You know, the mega projects are not funded by much by impact taxes. You know, whether that's the quarter cities transit way 270 uh you know m83 but we also do have an enormous list of projects that we have funded for clarksburg and that we have yet to fund councilmember juando mentioned the library uh, a few minutes ago i know councilmember albernos has talked about an aquatic center uh you know we have built we have observation drive more than 100 million dollars is in the capital budget multiple elementary, middle schools, expansion of the high school years ago. I mean, there's there's so much expense caught, related to building a Greenfield community. Um, it is not even, it's, you know, at one point there was a higher tax for people buying houses there that was dedicated just to Clarksburg. The council abolished that tax. Uh, Clarksburg does not, you know, no community pays for itself far from it, but the, the, the number of projects that we have now, that we've funded already, that we have now, that we have going forward in the capital budget, I think are, are significant, really significant. And I do think it is appropriate to have a greenfield level tax in order to help pay for that, recognizing that it does not pay for, it, you know, Clarksburg does not pay for itself, not by a long shot, you know, it couldn't. If Clarksburg had to pay for itself, none of what you see there would be there. Um, so we've got a long way to go there, but we are gonna need revenue to do it. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Uh Thank you, Mr. President. First, shout out to the Clarksburg outlets, which I visited this past weekend. Um, they are up and running and they are fantastic. So um, I guess I know we're taking straw votes here and obviously this is 
the first time I'm processing this in this way, and this has been an incredibly healthy discussion, and I appreciate the passion from which my colleague and friend um, that represents the Clarksburg area on the county has made, I think, some very credible arguments. What I need to better understand is the implications, and Councilmember Reamer, you had asked that question of staff on you know what this would mean for the rest of the plan, particularly as it relates to moratorium and some of those other areas. And so um, right now I, I'm leaning towards um, sticking with the committee recommendations, but I would like to hear more information about um, what the impact would be if we did just go to two um, on the rest of the plan as a whole. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll need to hear that um, because I am very sensitive to and very much understand the challenges within the Clarksburg community, which we know has a long history, um, both in its development, a lot of which I'm familiar with. So um, I, I'm leaning right now towards the planning board recommendations and, and the committee recommendations, but would like to hear a little bit more about potential impact. So that's where I'm at for the moment, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Glaze. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and you know, Following up on what Councilmember Albernaz had said, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, I'll say giddy up uh, to our first time at this rodeo. So, uh, you know, and I, it, it's interesting how we're having this conversation. Clearly, it is uh, an important and voluminous document um, with lots of policies in it. Um, and we're trying to piece them out and talk about them individually, but clearly uh, they are all interconnected. And, and that's what causes some uh, some concern, how one piece impacts the other pieces. Uh, and, you know, I, I really appreciate the, the sentiments and comments uh, by Councilmember Rice talking about the community, talking about Clarksburg, and, and talking about the equity issue, as I see it, quite frankly, about having one community pay for the needs in that specific community. That's how I interpreted uh, what was said. And the county hasn't typically done that. And when we talk about impact fees and we're talking about taxes, um, you know, there's a huge swath of homes that never paid those fees and taxes, particularly those built before 1990. I'm cognizant of that, as we all are as well. And so I, I come to this conversation just wanting to make sure we have a fair and equitable policy as much as we can here. And as it relates to, to having, you know, the two or the three different classifications, I, I'm not quite sure it is fair or equitable to have one community pay for all the needs in that one community because we are a huge county. And the beauty of this county is helping uplift all parts of the county. Uh, and so, so that's how I come to this particular um, point in, in, in the conversation. Um, I do appreciate the, the questions that Councilmember Albernaz just asked uh, in trying to get a sense of what, what the ramifications are, what uh, I'll use the terms maybe uh, intended or unintended consequences of these decisions might be. Um, but uh, this being the first time speaking about the SSP, I'm going to be looking at all of it. Uh, through a fairness and equity position, trying to make sure that we treat all of our communities uh, and all of our housing stock fairly. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the comments that have been made. Particularly appreciate uh, Councilmember Wright as the district council member, and totally empathize and understand where you're coming from. I do support the uh, committee recommendation, uh, however, respectfully. Um, I do just want to note a, a couple things. One, you know, I think this conversation has kind of veered off in a direction that I think is beyond what really the decision point is. This isn't about a community paying for all of the needs within the community. There's no community in the county uh, that, that is asked to do that or that does that. This is the adequate public facilities ordinance that is intended to charge for the impacts that new development has. We could have an argument of whether or not there should be impact taxes at all. I'd be more than happy uh, to have that philosophical uh, argument, whether the fact that we are charging unfairly new residents for the cost of existing residents, totally fair uh, conversation to have. But, but 
that's really not what this decision point is about. This is, uh, you know, about whether or not we are charging for a reasonable cost for the student generation that is being created by the new development based on the data that we have. That, that is what uh, the planning board proposal was. That's what the joint committee uh, supported. I understand if folks uh, don't believe that it, it should happen, that uh, but if we went in the other direction, it would be the opposite. It would be the rest of the county subsidizing the student generation uh, that is happening by uh, that uh, building type. And that's fine if we go in that direction, but it would be counter to many of the decisions elsewhere in this policy that we try to do to be as consistent as possible to charge for the actual uh, student generation that we have. That's why we went from 120 to 100%. That's why we disaggregated the data as much as we have. That's why we made the decision that we just made a few moments earlier in this very meeting, where we decided not to blend high rise and low and mid rise buildings because we recognize the fact that those data points are different. If we were gonna be consistent with uh, the viewpoint that uh, that shouldn't happen, then we should blend those uh, together as well. And we should only have one student generation standard across the board for everything. But that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're moving away uh, from that uh, decision because we recognize the fact that we have far greater data and far more information than we have had before. And we're trying our best to ensure that we are generating the revenue needed to provide the public facilities that are being created by the new development. So the, to the other point that was made in this meeting uh, and on this point, that we're afraid that this will disincentivize the growth that we want. That is a very important point, And I just wanna put a very significant pin on that point because every other decision point that we make, every decision point that we make, uh, you know, needs to have that overarching question uh, around it. And there are countless other decisions that we are going to make uh, and proposals that I know will be before us, decision points that were made that speak to that in a much more, I think, relevant uh, to the decision uh, uh, aspect uh, based on all the other public policy goals that we have. And I also need just want to point out, you know, when we talk about the cost of infrastructure, we have always charged more for folks who live farther away. Fair or unfair, that's what we've done. We do it on transportation, and there are reasons for that because the cost of the transportation is believed to be more the farther away you are from uh, infrastructure. And on student generation, the data that we have that was the underpinning of this entire you are freezing sorry you're back. About you're back you're back yeah I don't, the, the 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 data that we have that was the underpinning of much of this policy was centered around the significant student generation in clarksburg area which was the basis of this uh turnover area. I feel very strongly that we should not single out and have a completely different policy that singles out one particular community. I feel very strongly. I stood, uh, you know, uh, socially distanced shoulder to shoulder with council member Rice on that uh, point when he uh, uh, joined us. I, he, he passionately made that case. I strongly agree with him to have a unique policy just for one community seems inconsistent. It seems unfair. Uh, but to have the same policy, but that reflects uh, the uh, student generation based on housing types and based on uh, geography is exactly what this policy is intended to do. So I totally respect uh, all the points that have been made. I totally understand and appreciate uh, where Councilmember Rice and Councilmember Jawando and others are coming from, but I uh, feel that we should uh, move forward with the uh, joint committee recommendation uh, and, and proceed with that and hope that we can address some of these larger points in other areas of the policy, which I think are going to be very important as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Beck, did you have something, a comment? Yeah, just just one thing. I think there was questions, and I know I think Pam's going to be putting it in the packet next time as we've tried to nail down where the committee rates are now. But I know that with the planning board, um, for small, single family detached, the current rates were about $26,000 per unit, going up to 338 
Um, the biggest changes though, were in the multifamily and the multifamily high rise originally was about $6,000 a unit and would have gone up to about 25,000 per unit. So I think that's where the, some of the affordability concerns come in. I know that the committee recommendation, I believe did make that better. I just, I'm not clear on what those final numbers are at this point. It's your great interest to me as well. Council member Rice. So I saw both Pam and Jason shaking their heads. So what are those new numbers? See, I pay attention. Jason, you're muted. Yeah, Jason, you have to unmute and I'll see who can pull it up the fastest. We basically, I think, landed on these this, this morning with OMB. It's, I have to thank uh, Pofen Salam. She has been amazing and doing a ton of work with us uh, between her, Jason, myself, and Lisa Gavoni um, and Hai Subek. We have done constant recalculation. Um, Jason, do you have the most recent set of data? Yes, the, we're talking about the impact tax rates that uh, we want to on. show, right, where the current rate is, what the committee rate would be, and I guess. Okay, well, what I was just going to make reference to was the uh, table 12 in the packets on page 25. That shows that wh where uh, where we stand currently with regard to the impact taxes. And, and just to be clear that as we, you know, we've updated these numerous times, any time a change was made to any definition, any boundary of these areas, the infill areas, uh, uh, it, it moves houses in or out of an area, it moves students in or out of an area, and we would recalculate these. So. Um, what we what you have there in that table, it shows what the rates would be uh, based on the student generation rates in each of the different areas in the infill turnover and greenfield. And you can see that there is a difference on the, the single family between the uh, for both detached and attached between greenfield and the two other areas in terms of the students generated. Now on the, the multifamily side, here was the issue we had. When we were combining low rise and high rise together, we had what we felt was a sufficient number of multifamily units in the greenfield area to be able to calculate their own student generation rate and therefore own impact tax. But once we split it between low rise and high rise, which was the committee's recommendation, suddenly we had very, very few really in particular high rise apartments, uh, 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 multifamily units in that greenfield area, too few for us to be able to report. Our agreement with MCPS for the data that they share with us is that we can't report that. And and so we can't use that to calculate a student generate uh, a, um, a student generation rate or then a, an impact tax. And so uh, we set out with uh, council staff to try to come up with a way that made more sense. And I believe what we settled on was taking a look at um, uh, it, it was basically a relative share, right, um, Pam? I, I, you'll, you'll probably remember more. <laughs> I know we're both like, mm. um, well, we can look back at exactly how we did this, but you, you'll see that the new rates that we have there for multifamily in Greenfield are not all that far off from what they are um, in the other areas, and just about two hundred dollars more than turnover in the green uh, in in low rise and uh, about $1,000 more than the infill high rise rate is uh, for uh, infill. So uh, on the multifamily side, I mean, what the, in, ter in terms of incentive, what this might actually say is, well, maybe you might end up getting more multifamily in this area because the, the rates there are not all that far off from where they are the rest of the county. So I appreciate the information. Um, what I look at is, Infill areas, low rise in Down County, uh, 1,075, and infill low rise multifamily in Greenfield at 1,959, almost twice the cost. Is that table 14, right? Uh, oh, no, we're no, on no, table 12. 12. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're going to be a magnitude bigger. Okay, yeah. there we go. All right, so we're looking at 6,000 versus 11,000. So again, twice. And twice as much. And twice as much. Right. So, again, um, from looking at this from an equity standpoint, um, especially for multifamily low rise. Right. So the most affordable thing that you could build uh, for folks who are looking for affordable housing, we're charging twice the amount of what you would do in infill. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Well, I did want to point out how this compares to the current rates today. The current rate today, we have one countywide rate for low rise and it's $21,961. I understand that, but right. what I'm saying is what we're being proposed now right. creates an inequity. 
I, I understand that it's less all around. I get yeah. that. Um, that's the reason why Ms. Beck has her concerns. What I'm saying is, <laughs> no. is that it should be it should be the same. No, I understand. I understand where Ms. Beck is coming from as well. But look, all I'm saying is, is that in fairness and equitable treatment to the up county, why are we saying that we're going to pay twice as much for something built in the up county that we're trying to promote, which is multifamily, um, and charge that much more because we know what's going to happen. That's just going to get passed on to individuals. Developers aren't eating that cost. And it means that housing is much more expensive. And then the continued argument, look, let me just say this. Because um, I've been down this road before when it came to impact taxes for Clarksburg. And you're right, Councilmember Rimmer, we had this discussion and got rid of it because we thought it wasn't fair then mm -hmm. to have a higher impact tax for an area to have them pay for stuff that was already paid for. Look, I grew up in Silver Spring, so I know, I understand, I get it. My parents bought their house in 1972, so well before any impact tax and all that. And guess what? Everybody else had to pay for all that infrastructure to happen. That Glenmont Metro wasn't paid for by my neighborhood nor by my parents, right? That was paid for by other folks who came afterwards. So it's the same sort of thing. So again, to all of a sudden say that now we're going to hold folks and say, well, you have to pay for it because nobody else did before and we have to make up for that. And we're going to hit you harder than everybody else. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. And so, you know, look, I, it, it is what it is. When I look at the single family, I mean, it's still $13,000 difference. That means $13,000 more that a person would pay, which does disincentivize uh, folks from moving to the up county, which is also a little bit concerning because we have a lot of our challenges down county also in some of those other areas. So it may encourage more infill development when folks want to talk about the challenges that we face there and overcrowding and those kinds of things there. Uh, the same thing applies. I mean, Blair, keep in mind, just like you said, Councilmember Reamer, we passed uh, to deal with the moratorium uh, to allow for an affordable project to move forward, but they're in moratorium, so it's no different. It really isn't, and I don't understand why we are so stuck on having to make sure that this Clarksburg area is going to have to pay more, when in fact you could argue the same exact premise for any other area in the county and why they should pay uh, uh, their their fair share. And so, you know. It, it is what it is at this point. I, I think I've made my point over and over again, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to make another very important point that I think we're, we're glossing over here. Mr. Friedson talked about the data and, and being consistent. The planning board didn't have the data that Ms. Dunn used at the time they made this decision when you reevaluated the pipeline and added that data in, what, what's, what's online, it moved it into the turnover area as defined by the criteria. Did I state that correctly, Ms. Dunn? You're, you're on mute. Yeah, correct. I, all I did was ask to add a different, a new criteria that was more forward-looking. And adding the one new criteria that was more forward-looking re-indexed all the planning areas that they had created, and actually two changed. Germantown North um, went from, I believe, infill to turnover. It also, as recognition that there will be less development there as well, but the nature of that development was proposed to be multifamily. And Clarksburg or, Green, or the Greenfield area went to turnover because, again, less development was expected, although it still would be um, multi, uh, single family in nature. Um, so it was just adding a new piece of information, a new piece of relevant new data to the criteria for categorization right and, and, I, and so, and so that I, was the result i appreciate that and i just think that's an important point this isn't just all the points notwithstanding that we've made there is a data-driven uh you know reason to to not distinguish in this way I, the other question i wanted to ask because again this is a, a larger issue we have the data sorry on page 12 of what they would go to What's the, where's the table of what they are currently? Is that, where is, so that we can just see that as well? Um, I'm not sure if that's included in the table in the report or not. Um, I didn't, I didn't see it. I was looking for it, but can, right. could, you, could someone okay. relevantly give the, the change, you know, what the relative change is? Yeah. Jason, you have it in front of you. Well, I could pull up. I could pull up what the current rates are. Is that what we're asking? And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I can share my screen, I've got it up right now. 
Uh, these are the rates that are actually published. There we go. Uh, the rates that are published on the the county's website. So um, I've just focused in here on the school rates. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, if I could to just for a second, kind yeah, of go ahead. Go ahead. Frame frame the question that's before you all with uh, on this. It's. And I think uh, Council Member Glass was right in that all of them, we all know that all of these things and the decisions are so interrelated. And so uh, part of the question that you have before you is, is it, wh whether or not it makes sense to have three areas and what are they going to be used for? So, you know, when we as in the planning board was recommending maintaining a moratorium in that greenfield area, it, it, it made sense because that was an area where we thought it could still be effective. We didn't think it could be effective elsewhere. So if you're inclined to say, get rid of the moratorium altogether, the question is, do we still need the Greenfield designation? The only way that we would actually be using that now would be for these impact taxes. So if you think that these impact taxes are, it doesn't make sense to distinguish between you know, the, the Greenfield area from the rest, right. then, then maybe we don't need the Greenfield designation. Uh, but if you believe that we need to have, you know, be, be actually charging based on what we believe the impact is, then we can maintain that, that Greenfield uh, designation. But we're not going to be using it. Uh, I will say that we can calculate student generation rates for any geography at any point and use that data for whatever decision point we want to make at any point in the future, right? Um, but, it, you know, the question is, do you want to use these geographies to be able to make the impact taxes? Now, if you want to keep what the planning board had recommended and maintain a, a moratorium in an area where you think it could still be effective, then that's another reason to keep the Greenfield area. So it's really like, how, how, what do you really want to be able to get out of this? And so I don't know if you can make that decision today or right now without thinking about all of those other questions that will come later. I appreciate it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Satori, uh, Santori. Uh, and, and obviously the committee did recommend getting rid of the moratorium completely. I, I had a slightly different view, which we'll talk about later of keeping a kind of an emergency button at 135, going from 120 to 135. Um, but we agreed on having a countywide policy. Mr. Fritz and I agreed on that. And I think the committee agreed on that. Um, if you look at this, just keep it up for one more second, 26,000 uh, for single family detached versus what it, we're going down uh, $6,000 to $20,000 for infill uh, in the most densely populated areas, and then $21,000, so a $5,000 or so drop in turnover. And then a seven, what is that? Do my math for seven, eight, almost an $8,000 increase in the greenfield mm -hmm. for single family detached from what's currently being charged. Um, so everyone else goes down. Again, Clarksburg goes up. I just think it was important to know vis-a-vis, -vis, you can unshare now, Mr. Sant, uh, Sartori, thank you. Um, and so, again, when you add the, and then, but when you add the factor, as I said, with Ms. Dunn, that pipeline information, you get into turnover. So I, I just want to make sure that my colleagues understand that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. No Councilmember Navarro. Thank you. Um, so... I guess I just want to share that, you know, when we had this conversation in the joint committee, we <clears throat> spoke about the overall um, purpose or I guess framework of this proposal of the SSB. And the idea was that they were going to create these different zones because they were trying to align it with our, you know, broad policy goal for uh, how we deal with land use. So, the point was that, yes, we're trying to achieve more affordable housing in places where we may not have them as much. Uh, yes, we would like to promote uh, transit-oriented development. Yes, we want more middle um, wow. you know, uh, housing, uh, uh, the uh, missing middle housing, uh, hopefully in places where we just don't have them, but that we have then, you know, the infrastructure. Yes, we recognize that in the up county, there has been a lot of development and it has been step up housing. And that's been really great. But obviously, there's been some issues with access to, for example, transit. And so trying to figure out, you know, where it is that we would like to not only promote more development, but being cognizant of the impact that it has depending on where we are. If we want to talk about equity, then in reality it throws this whole entire exercise uh, 
you know, it, it, throw, it, it just throws it all out because we are doing different uh, zones for that reason. So if we're going to say that it's about being, you know, about equity issues, then I guess that just means that we're just going to treat everything exactly the same, except that we started this whole exercise recognizing the reality on the ground, that there are some areas of the county that obviously, for a lot of reasons, some of them, which was just people realizing, hey, you know, this is my opportunity for step up housing. Maybe my commute is going to be longer, but it's more affordable. Boom, I like to be there. Um, you know, places where we might even have right now metro stations, Glenmont was mentioned. We haven't seen a lot of the kind of, you know, redevelopment and amenities there. So there are a lot of very, a lot of moving pieces that don't fit perfectly. Um, but the notion and the proposal that I understood of this particular SSB was to recognize that we as a council had adopted certain policy goals regarding development, regarding infrastructure like schools, and we wanted to somehow incentivize that. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, give clarity to at least where I was coming from, because the assertion that sometimes, you know, that this is not about equity because we want to continue to have an area that has been built out pretty nicely and people have found, you know, great homes there, et cetera, not close to transit whatsoever, that the fact that we recognize that the impact, for example, on schools may be a little higher there, even though as it was shown, it's the, the tax is lower than what it is now, somehow that's equity, then that just throws out the whole, in my opinion, framework of this exercise. And so that's how I came to, um, to this, you know, this is not, this is about new construction. This is not about the people who live there already. This is about recognizing that in particular parts of the county, there is a particular impact that is felt pretty strongly because of the student generation. And that we're trying to also figure out, you know, how do we actually get more affordable housing in different areas where we can minimize the impact, be it transportation, be it schools, what are some other tools that we have? Um, but it is true, as some of my colleagues have said, that we are kind of making this decision outside of the context of some other decisions made in committee, which perhaps I just you know offer that maybe we need to pair those decisions so that there could be a clearer picture versus us, you know, deciding on this and then later on realizing that another committee recommendation had a direct impact on this decision. So I don't know if that's more for council staff to kind of organize, you know, the, those decisions that are kind of predicated on each other. So that way we are being a bit more efficient with, um, with the ultimate decision. Because, you know, the decision on moratorium affects this particular decision. There's no doubt. Uh, and maybe we need to kind of take those together and have side-by-side -side sort of, um, you know, illustration of how one feeds another and whether one should affect how we decide on the other. Um, so I just wanted to share that because there's been a lot of things that have been thrown out there. Um, and, you know, at least for me personally, I came at this conversation and this is what the joint committee decided, including Council President Katz, that we, we kind of came at this from that perspective, um, that now we're having these different zones and they're there for a reason and they respond to the policy goals that we had, you know, all embraced um, to a certain degree. And um, so anyway, just just feel that it would be useful for efficiency's sake, but also for good policy making that we try to pair as much as possible decisions that are have been made in different committees, but that are, you know, but that have interconnected um, consequences if we make one decision and or not the other. Thank you. Thank you. As, and that's one of the reasons in the beginning, I thought that we needed to fit this puzzle together rather than do it individually. I, and candidly, I've changed my opinion on this one topic. I think that there is a fairness problem. I believe that that if we want Clarksburg, I mean, if, if we want Clarksburg to prosper, that that uh, having spending twice as much on this is not is not a fair thing. And can, quite candidly, as has been pointed out time and time again, no area paid for itself. People who lived in Clarksburg before there was a Clarksburg of today helped pay for Silver Spring. 
I can tell you there was people living in Clarksburg. It was, certainly was not as many, but there were people who lived there who helped pay for the other infrastructure in other places. And now we're saying the, the other places get to have a, a, a lesser cost because of, of Clarksburg. To me, that's not fair. And that's why I changed my opinion. Council Member Albernaz. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciated Council Member Navarro's suggestion of as we look at these issues, this is the first of what will likely be many um, decision points that are going to have differing views. And I think it's unfair to look at each one of them in a vacuum because they are connected and I'm still processing how exactly these issues are connected. And so, uh, you know, we're taking straw votes today and on this one in particular, I'm very sensitive to and understand um, the concerns of my district colleague, you know, in the Northern part of the County, but want to better understand how this connects to the broader plan um, before definitively agreeing with the concern that this disproportionately impacts one community, because we are looking at this holistically. And council member Reamer brought up the point of amenities. Um, and I know my Clark, the, the Clarksburg community um, has been waiting for an indoor aquatic facility and full service recreation center for too long. Uh, and so it's those amenities that in particular um, people want to be able to push forward. But those decisions are made in a different process through the CIP and through the operating budget. And while all these issues are connected, it's not exactly a straight line. And I want to make sure that our community understands that across the entire county. Um, and so those are priorities we need to make in a, in a separate discussion. But that doesn't minimize this discussion and the impact on overall growth across the county, but Clarksburg as well. Um, but I just, for, for the millions watching at home, as everyone always says, um, I think it's important to make that point. So um, on this one, Mr. Council President, I, I, I need more information. And I like Council Member Novato's suggestion to the staff, if possible, um, maybe clarifying as we make individual decisions line item by line item, where they may be impacted in other parts of the proposal, um, which I know is complicated and, and probably not perfect. Um, but, you know, that that would be helpful for me uh, having this be the first time that I'm having a chance to weigh in on any of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. So again, the, the Greenfield concept was based on student generation uh, that first of all, we see already. Uh, uh, let me ask Jason to just explain a little bit what was embodied in the Greenfield concept, uh, you know, upon which this is layered. Sure, so we, um, the analysis that we did, we found basically, um, one of the, you guys will probably remember the, the graph that I showed, the bubble chart, right? This was something that kind of stimulated this thought in us and how to approach this, where we showed the amount of new units that were being built, the share of those units that were single family versus multifamily, and then the number of students was the size of that bubble. And really what we saw from a, a school cluster perspective was that the, the Clarksburg cluster stood out from every other because it was uh, a lot of new units being built, almost predominantly single family and generating a ton of students. And so we had other places, Gaithersburg, where we had a lot of new units being built, but it's mostly multifamily and it's generating very few students. And so um, we said, let's look at those three dimensions, amount of housing growth, type of housing growth, and then amount of enrollment growth. And when we did that and we analyzed that, that's where we identified these three different areas. Our infill areas were areas where we said we've got uh, a, a lot of growth, but it's mostly multifamily generating very few students on a per unit basis. Turnover was our areas where we saw, you, uh, you pretty much saw no new growth, very little new growth. And any enrollment growth that we saw was due to the turnover of existing single family homes. And then we had the Greenfield where we didn't say, we didn't say let's, I call it Clarksburg. We said it's Greenfield and there could be other areas when we reevaluate this in the future that could fall into this category. Um, but the idea was this was where you see mostly single family being built a lot of the, a lot of new single family being built and it's generating a lot of students. Now, if Clarksburg changes, if that area changes and we reevaluate this in four years and suddenly it's more multifamily being built or it's kind of slowed down, it would change its designation based on the, the analysis that we had done. Okay, so I think that was 
one of the compelling comments. It's sort of like there's a baby boom in Clarksburg. And we have had to spend, because we should, you know, a lot of capital dollars building the elementary, middle, uh, you know, high school capacity. And I think constituents outside of Clarksburg will want to know that dollars are also being preserved for other school needs outside of Clarksburg. And that was kind of the rationale for why there's a little bit of a higher rate. You know, the rate was adjusted in this proposed recommendation. Um, but, you know, that that was the, the theory of the Greenfield is that it's the concentration of a particular type of housing that produces a huge number of children. And then we have to build the facilities for that. And if you look down the road, there is more coming school-wise in Clarksburg. And so we felt like that's what this tax is for. It's for the, all the people who live in Clarksburg. Uh, you know, it's so that they can, and, it, and it's only a small fraction of the money that is needed in Clarksburg, to be very clear. Uh, most of the money for Clarksburg comes from the rest of the county, but it's just a, it's a it's a margin to help fund the significant school needs that they have, which are felt you know very deeply there. Everyone is like everywhere in the county feeling that you know they they need more investment in school construction. So um, you know again, Jason, Table Twelve, uh, you know you're you're pointing out that the uh, what what is proposed for Clarksburg is a change from the current policy. Uh, there is actually a, a modest reduction based on other formulas that have been adjusted in the impact taxes. So there's a, a less of a of an impact tax in Clarksburg, um, but uh, for multifamily. For multifamily, but single family is similar. It's actually it's still a reduction though, right? No, uh, no single no. family goes up. A lot, eight thousand dollars a unit up. Yeah, eight thousand dollars a unit because that's where the student generation is the highest. For single family detached, it goes up about mm, uh, seventy six hundred dollars, and then uh, single family attached townhouses, it goes up a little over a thousand from where they are yeah. today. All right. Well, you know, maybe we're stuck here a little bit today. Um, and uh, you know we could we could keep moving. I mean, I uh, you know, Councilmember Albernos has suggested maybe we take a little bit more time here. I, I think that's fine. Yeah. You know, could I could I, I jump in the end? I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get in your way here. Please, I, because we no. need to be finishing this topic. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to return to this, I just wanted to say that, um, and I think this is part of what Councilmember Navarro was getting at uh, in her comments, which I thought were right on the mark, and she was alluding to the fact that in the uh, joint committee's work sessions, there was a lot of discussion about the idea that the rates should be driven by what the costs are, that you should just look at the data and to look at what, who has generated how much cost in the recent past or, you know, whatever period of time looking backwards and charge rates accordingly. So I think that you know, it's important just to remember if you want to do this, and I'm not like trying to, you know, throw my body in front of the speeding train here. If you want to, if you want to change, if you want to get rid of the greenfield rates, that's fine. But just keep in mind that the whole policy has a lot of similar decisions about reconciling a lot of competing priorities, smart growth, affordability, um, equity, and also aligning the charges with the costs that are incurred. So if you want to step back from that idea that the cost should be aligned with the charges, that's fine. But I would hope that you just keep in mind that you're going to make several decisions about what the planning board draft and the joint committee's decision that call on you to make that choice again. And I, we're, I, my hope would just be that you try to be as consistent as possible so the policy is not disjointed and reflects different set of considerations on different questions. Thank you. And to the point, I, I think it has to be made. My guess is there are many, many, many more schools in the down county area than there are in Clarksburg. I, I, I think that 
to, to say that they're paying for what they do, you know, for what they've done. Let's count schools. That's wrong. I, I count some member free. I've got to say, I'm really confused by this whole conversation, to be honest with you. I mean, I totally understood where council member Rice was coming from in the beginning. I think we've veered off the path uh, quite a bit. Um, there are a lot of down county schools. A lot of those schools were closed. They were closed because there was a generation in between when people originally moved in and when they moved out or passed away or whatever the case may be, and new families moved back in as part of the prevailing aspect of this entire plan that underpins it all, which is essentially that uh, turnover of existing housing and new single family homes are what is generating the preponderance, the vast overwhelming majority of uh, school capacity and student generation. That is the entire basis of this entire policy on the school side. Every decision that we have made is based on that fact. And then there have been you know, policy decisions based off of that. And there are ramifications uh, for those uh, decisions. But a, a couple points. One, if we want to get into an argument of which community is paying in and how much they're paying in in terms of public costs, I'd be happy uh, to have that conversation uh, with colleagues. And I'm sure there's a number of people in my district who would uh, be happy to make uh, that case through property taxes, uh, impact taxes, and, and other costs, uh, because impact taxes do not stay in the community uh, where they are. The school uh, facilities payments used to, the ups that we'll be taking up later on on this, which are the newest iteration or a similar version uh, of, of that will stay uh, in if we follow what the uh, committee, uh, you know, ha have, have put forward. If we are moving in the direction that we're talking about, either we should have one impact tax cost for all students, regardless of where it is, regardless of what property type. Uh, I don't support that, but that is the direction that we should go in, because uh, that would be at least a reasonable public policy uh, to me, or we should keep things the way that they are, or we should get rid of impact taxes altogether and find other, you know, better, uh, more uh, spread across the entire county ways uh, to generate revenue so that we're not unfairly charging new residents for the cost of existing residents. I would be happy to have a broad philosophical argument and discussion over whether or not impact taxes are the best way to fund infrastructure. But that would be a dramatic overhaul of everything that we have done for many, many years. Is there a reasonable uh, aspect to that public policy discussion? Absolutely. Are we at a competitive disadvantage for a number of these things because of the way that we structure it? Absolutely we are. Does this policy help move us in a more data-driven direction that I think makes us uh, more competitive? I believe it does. I believe that we've made uh, those uh, decisions. The last piece of this is, the discussion of who's paying for what and what community and who's subsidizing what, the costs associated with are based on the student generation rates for the place and type that are being discussed. What council staff did, unless I'm mistaken, is looked at the pipeline and said, is this really different based on what is, it, what, what is going to look uh, you know, prospectively? But the student generation rates based on these different areas of the county you know, were used based on uh, the, the recommendation that they were made. Uh, Ms. Dunn, could you clarify uh, what you used to, to uh, adapt yes. and adjust the recommendation? Yeah, I, I'll try to be fast because I know it, everyone's at the end of this conversation. Um, all I said was basically the planning staff, this was their um, methodology. They picked metrics by which to measure these planning areas. Okay. So <laughs> Everybody has something. The hounds of Clarksburg. Well, and I agree with him too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he it's took the mail. Out of my um, yeah. um, so they applied the metrics that would basically categorize these planning areas. So, right, the metrics categorize the planning areas. All we said was newer, more prospective looking, looking in the future data about what's the delta between how you have zoning capacity and what's already been approved or built, right? It's already been approved. That means it's pipeline. Didn't change the pipeline. Just that means it's approved or it's been built. But what's left out there, right? Somebody's going to come forward with an application because that's what SSP is about, people coming forward with an application. When you put that new metric in, 
adding it to all the other metrics they currently have, right? Didn't change the rest of their analysis. Just adding that metric to the housing growth piece of it recategorized the greenfield as turnover. And it recategorized North Germantown as turnover from infill. And it was just saying we looked at the data differently. It didn't reevaluate, it didn't recalculate. Right, but it's based on, it's what I was saying though, it's based on prospective looking looking at in, in, into the future. It's looking at what Which we is a projection that is going data. to be. Yes. It, what is it, development going to be? It's because the potential. That's what the policy should address. It's, not it's what development it potential, which is prospective. It's looking into the future. I think it's it's looking at the future. Okay. So, and that 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 is reasonable. But what what the policy that the uh, that that we use and that we have used for the the entire basis of this entire plan is based on the data, not based on the prospective. It is data. Projections. I don't understand why it's not data. Because it's not based on student generation. It's based on what that we expect the housing is not capacity based on student generation before. either. The other data were metrics to carve a geography out of which you then calculated student generation, right? They they took a, a process to categorize places. Mr. Sartori, is the student gener are the student, student generation, generation rates at the student generation rates based on the actual data? Because I've seen the chart that you've shown, and the circle is overwhelming. Uh, are the student generation rates in what the uh, the planning board categorized as greenfield different than what the planning board categorized as turnover? Yes, yes, they are different. Okay. They're different geographies. They basically carved up the county into different. No, 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 no. I'm not asking about geography. I didn't ask what the hills look like. I asked, are the student generation rates based yes. on greenfield and based on turnover, which is what this policy is focused on? The actual student generation rates are they different? Yes, they are. So, all right. So, I, I just wanted to point that out. The, the last two points that I'll make: one, we're talking about equity. This is about funding public schools. So that that's literally all this is talking about. It's about funding public schools, and this whether w w if we take the committee's recommendation, it's more money uh, for for public schools. If we reject the committee's recommendation, it would be less money for school. I just want to like be very clear. Uh, 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 about that. And then uh, uh, last, unless I'm mistaken, impact taxes make up only about 12% of the uh, capital budget. It's not, it's the, the idea that impact taxes pay exclusively for schools. That's not what they're supposed to do. Impact taxes are supposed to pay for the marginal increase of the cost of a new student that is being generate, generated by that particular student. And we get to transportation, it's supposed to pay for the marginal cost of the increased infrastructure for transportation for that particular development. That's what we're talking about here. It's not saying one community has to pay for things and other communities don't and what the breakdown is. It's supposed to be, we decided what is 100% cost of the student and then we determined what is the student generation rate based on different areas of the county and we are you know, applying them uh, accordingly. So I will say I, I will continue to be uh, where the committee recommendation uh, was, appreciate the uh, discussion, um, and we'll see where everything lands. Okay, thank you. Council Member Jawando. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I I just, I, I'm glad that point happened. I was going to underscore the, the point about we are using data, and, and this policy is, which is uh, was a unanimous recommendation, it's called the growth uh, adequacy policy, or well, I, I'm messing it up already, Pam, but we agree. Mm -hmm. Growth and, growth and infrastructure. Growth and infrastructure policy, which is by its very definition prospective and forward looking. So I think I think uh, it is totally appropriate to to use that type of data to to look at and, and analyze this. Um, and so to, I wanted to go back because I can count the votes and to my good friend Councilmember Albernaz, and just to try to answer his his point of that the two things that I think, and, and, and Mr. S uh, Sartori or, or Ms. Dunn or whomever can correct me on this, that I think this has an interplay with is one, and I think Mr. Sartori stated this pretty well a few, you know, 15 minutes ago, it's the decision to have a moratorium or not. Um, and that was, I was the dissenter, but the committee said no moratorium for anywhere. I recommended to keep, push it up to 120, from 120 to 135. Uh, so if there there already is, I think, an overwhelming, again, counting votes, consensus to not have a moratorium. So I think that 
is probably we could probably answer that right and we could have that discussion now but i think the writing's on the wall on that and then the other issue that Ms. dunn spoke to but not in specificity and i don't know if we have those numbers is that if you eliminated the greenfield the rates would change uh slightly and and yeah. and, and and the turnover rates would go up slightly okay. higher a bit, right? yes. but not a lot but not a lot and recognizing and that's what would those are the two things my understanding and I, i'm asking too and also talking to Councilman Rodgers, but asking staff, are there any other things that are dependent on this discussion, this decision point? No, I mean, the, the basically having the, re, this is really, the conversation started about should we have regional student generation rates? Right. Regional student generation rates come into play for evaluating applications and master planning. And basically today they use regional generation rates. That was the point Mr. Sartori was trying to make. You don't have to continue to have regional generation rates or introduce regional rates from that in impact taxes. But you have gone that way, and that was what the planning board recommended, the more context-sensitive impact taxes. Okay, so they could still have three regions for the way they evaluate master plans and applications. You could choose, I think they should be consistent, but you could choose to say, we think the newer data is, is valuable, and we therefore pick two regions to have impact taxes. Right. As far as the moratorium goes, yeah, the committee has made a decision loud and clear that it should be countywide. So whether or not you have the moratorium is less the issue of the fact that they voted unanimously to whatever they did, apply it countywide. Yes. And I, and right there, you don't need to have a conversation about how the SSP interrelates to that issue and whether or not you keep Greenfield. Yeah, and that was the decision I agreed with. And the last thing I just want to say is that the point, I think Mr. Anderson made this and it's been made by a couple other people, this is not a departure from making sure we're collecting the impact from where it's generated. Uh, this, what again, a database decision to look at the pipeline and look prospectively, and it went into a different category. So I, I just, I just, I don't, I don't, I just want to push back against that. At later points, I think there's going to be a, a robust argument and discussion about uh, what we should be incentivizing and not. And so I, I do think this is a database decision. So, um, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know. I'm happy, you, you, Mr. President. You, good luck. You know, but you, I call, we can call for the vote or do whatever you want to do. Well, that's, we do have two more speakers. But what I'm going to suggest, and I've had, I have, I've had more text. I have more uh, 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 pen pals today than I've ever had. I have more texts from people giving a variety of suggestions. But one of the overall uh, suggestions is that we take a pause on this. We've had a robust conversation. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, we've had a robust conversation. I think that we should uh, ask our staff to go back and get some of the information that people are looking at and asking for. And um, and then we take this up again. We we also have a closed session that we need to have at the end of, t of today. And so if, if that meets with my colleagues' approval, I think we should take a pause and we should come back. We should go to our closed session and 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 end this meeting. I don't want anybody to think we're coming back to this meeting uh, and go to our closed session and then take this up again uh, next week uh, once we can get some additional information. I'm seeing some smiles. I, I guess that's a good idea. So uh, and some thumbs up. So I, I will turn Mr. to Council Rice. You were the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just I would just like to clarify one of the things, and so I'd like to ask staff when they're coming back to be able to work on this because there was an assertion made that somehow we're defunding schools or not giving schools as much money by uh, changing of the impact tax and not doing the greenfield. I'd like to see what those numbers look mm -hmm. like, and of course these are also decisions that we can make, so we can certainly change the infill and turnover numbers to ensure that we're not losing revenue. So it's a false dichotomy, one that I think isn't helpful to the discussion. Uh, and certainly one in which I think we can address uh, depending on however we want to move forward with the discussion. So, Councilmember Juwando, if it's to your agreement, will you withdraw the, the amendment for the, for this week? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I happily with, withdraw with pending further discussion, and I agree with Councilmember Rice's point that, that we these numbers, we should look at all of them because, I you know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with raising the uh with lowering how much we did on the other impact taxes you know but we that's what happened so uh yes thank you i would i'm happy to withdraw very good ms dunn uh, um are you okay that we're putting a pause on this and 
literally will be coming back. I have a feeling you, you saw that coming, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was pretty clear. Um, we will try to have a lot more information that I will take the lead from what you have all commented on today and um, try to provide you with some guidance for that next week. Very good. And Dr. Orland, I know you'll be back next week as well. So, uh, yeah, so that was happy trails. <laughs> that was perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. We are moving. Uh, just, well, unless there's anybody else that wants to have any other discussion on this for the moment, we're going to pause this. We're going to uh, go now to the proposed closed session. We need a motion to discuss public security. If the public body determines a public discussion we continue, would constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including the deployment of fire and police services and staff and the development and implementation of emergency plans pursuant to Maryland Provisions Article uh, Subsection 3-305, Subsection B-10. The topic is security for civic events. Is there a motion to go to closed session? So moved. So moved by Councilmember Reamer, and it's been seconded by Vice President Hawker. All those in favor, please raise your hand. We are, yes, that carries unanimously. We're going to close Mr. session. Mr. President, yes. can I just, could I just request a five minute bathroom break before? You, you can, our five minute. We, we're going to give Councilmember Juano, though, that was a little bit more information than we needed. <laughs> we're we're going to give Councilmember Juano a five minute break for whatever he would like to do. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.